What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heroes 59. That's right. It's the 59th episode of Collider Heroes. I'm John Schnepp, and we got a lot of stuff to dig into. Let's start it off with uh, welcoming our big cast and crew. Over here, we got Robert Meyer Burnett. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. How you doing? Doing good. We got John Campia. Hey, everybody. Just want you to know, I know we've been waiting. We've been asking forever, on and on and on, waiting and waiting, waiting. I think we're about to talk today about The Rock finally being in another movie. What? <laughs> yes. Oh, my no God. Way. Not another film. Yes. Yes. He's in everything. We've got the, the, Amy Dallin is back here. What's going on? Hello. How are you guys doing today? We are we are all very happy that we're all here. And I got before we rock into the show, I got a quick announcement. Uh, we are moving Collider Heroes from today, Tuesday, to, to NBC. To NBC. That's right. We signed a multi-billion dollar. No, we're just moving it one twenty-four. I wish that we were moving. Now it we're buying to, islands. Well, all of us have our own separate uh, superhero complexes, but we all sort of about a mile apart. We just mm -hmm. you know gyroscope back and forth. We're moving to tomorrow to to Wednesday. So Collider Heroes will be on on Wednesdays. What's happening is a new show that we're doing here at Collider. It's called Collider Nightmares. Now, I don't know if you guys have that. We can we throw that up on the screen. We don't have it up on the screen. You can't see it then. I'm sorry, but <laughs> look look for it next week. It's called Collider Nightmares. It's hosted by Clark Wolf. It's a one-hour uh, show of John Schnepp and me playing naked volleyball. That's right. And it's man, titled Nightmares. It is a nightmare, but the good, the good kind of nightmare that gives you beautiful <laughs> dreams of hope and aspirations. But no, Some folks are throwing money at the screen right now. They, you know they, that, right? they really should be. It should be hundreds. <laughs> make only, it rain, boys. Make only, it rain. Make it rain in the hundo, son. Um, but you know what? It's called, Collider, it's called Collider Nightmares. Clark Wolf is the host. It's got Perry ne Nemiroff, myself, and Mark Riley are going to be on. We're going to talk about everything horror and genre related in that world. So that'll be coming on Tuesdays, starting next Tuesday. And Collider Heroes will be moving to Wednesday, which is the greatest day of all because it is comic book release day. All new comics come out at all your comic book stores on Wednesday. You'll be seeing Amy Dallin. She'll still be a part of the show. We're going to figure out. Weeks. We're going to figure out. She might not be on every week, but we're going to keep her. As if much possible. as we can have her, if possible, we're going to make and sure. And I, I don't want people to get the impression that, that uh, Nightmares has is bumping Heroes out. Actually, the move to Wednesday is something that that you've actually wanted to yeah. do. For, you, you and I have talked about it for months now. You yeah. always thought that the right home for Heroes was on Wednesday. Yeah, and the, re the, reason, the reason that, you know, I even talked with it about John many months ago was like, hey, look, every time we, we do show notes, usually the night before, so I'm doing notes for the entire week on Monday. And usually, like Monday around four or five, all news usually drops on Tuesday morning. The comic book news. The comic book yeah. news. Or Tuesday they'll run morning. those trailers on Kimmel. Kimmel. You know, <laughs> we will miss. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll miss Kimmel's the trailers been killing on us Kimmel. With every trailer <laughs> dropping on, on Kimmel. Jimmy? Doctor Strange, Wednesday Batman, Beast, Superman. Huh. Yeah, Tuesday night. Or Tuesday night. Or, yeah, it's always Tuesday night. It's like after we're done. So, so that way, this this gives us a little more of a head start to get you know a good tasty amount of news for you for the whole week. You know, obviously we'll still miss out on Wednesday, but we always try to, you know, pick back up. So that's been something that's been going on for six months, and we finally are making that shift. So don't worry if you, if you know, you miss Tuesday, you'll, you should watch uh, Collider Nightmares, but we'll be on Wednesday now. So I'd like to think it's your homage to the Mickey Mouse Club. Because yeah. it wasn't Wednesday surprise day. <laughs> I think Robert was talking Anything about Anything can Wednesday. happen, and it usually does. Well, let's call Ryan Gosling. He'll tell us. Surprise day. I, right. I like that it's surprise day. It's All right, surprise so day. Collider I Heroes, I don't we're that. moving to the sweatiest day of the week, Wednesday. Mark it down in your sweaty calendars. Let's get on to the news that John already talked a little bit about. It is the... <laughs> Rock, he's in another movie. Finally, he's finally in another <laughs> franchise. It's this time he's playing Doc Savage. All right, it's not Black Adam, it's not Lobo, it's Doc Savage. The, this man is literally in everything, and that's totally okay with us. He's Hobbs, he's in Baywatch, he's Black Adam, he's in some new Ludlum spy trilogy. He's got that comedy coming out next week. That's with right, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. He's Central an unstoppable machine. He's cooking a lot of whatever. He's cooking the rock. He's now he's Doc Savage, and it's in writer director Shane Black's next film after he makes the new Predator for movie. He's going to do Doc Savage. So Doc Savage is indeed the very first Superman that that was ever came out in the pulp com uh, comics, not comics really, the pulp uh, graphic novels that were just written. Uh, he, it was introduced in the magazines that brought us The Shadow, The Phantom. In fact, many say Doc Savage was the inspiration for Superman and Batman just without the weird angles. So The Rock said on his Instagram, he's literally the master of everything, but he's the number one reason, here's the number one reason I'm excited to play 
Doc Savage, he's a freaking uh, effing hilarious weirdo. Conf <laughs> confidently, yet innocently, he has zero social graces whatsoever due to his upbringing, so every interaction he has with someone is direct, odd, often uncomfortable, and amazingly hilarious. After speaking for hours with Shane Black, I can see why the creator of Superman took only the best parts of Doc Savage and left the weirdo parts behind. But to us, that weirdo part is what makes Clark Doc Savage dope. Can't wait to sink my teeth into this one-of-a-kind character. So what do we all think about The Rock? What is he cooking? Robert Meyer Burnett, what do you think? Well, I think it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> well oh, done. I had to do it. I was well going to say, done. I was gonna, we didn't have enough time to prep it. I want Campia to stop me. Well Campia, done. what do you think about Well, my thoughts about it. It's <laughs> too late. It's not too awkward. Anyway, we're doing a rock bit. What are your thoughts? I <laughs> know. Uh, I thought Doc Savage, you know, I, I went back and George Powell produced a Doc Savage movie, Doc Savage Man of Bronze with Ron Eli in like mm -hmm. 1970. Yes. And I remember when I was a kid because I loved Conquest of Space and I loved War of the Worlds and when worlds collide, but I did not like the Doc Savage Man of Bronze movie and I felt bad about mm -hmm. that. So I did a little history reading back in the day about Doc Savage. And now he had a, a group of guys that he used to work with, like military dudes. Like he would team up with, there was a major and there was a colonel. He had an oath. Like the Green Lanterns had an mm. oath. Mm. I don't know what that oath is. My friend has it tattooed on his arm. Oh, really? the Doc Savage I haven't Savage checked oath? in on this news with him yet, but I'm really excited. Okay. <laughs> I hope he's happy. So he should be able to recite it by rote. I, I cannot. But And then somebody, you know, he's taught to be, just like John, you'd pointed out, being Batman. Right. He's trained himself to be the most, he's not quite superhuman, but he's almost superhuman because he's the perfect example of a man. Let and me he was read, even described let as me read the oath. Christ like. Let me strive every moment of my life to make myself better and better to the best of my ability that all may profit from it. Let me think of the right and lend my something, something. It goes on. It's a long oath. Yes, but I, I mean, he really is like, <laughs> you can see, especially the DC universe. I think a lot of the DC universe characters were taken or inspired by Doc Savage. Definitely. What are your thoughts about The Rock playing Doc Savage? Look, The Rock is, a, he's a living comic book character. Like, and if you look at a lot of the, the roles he plays in the movies he's in, he's already kind of playing a comic book. Hobbs is kind of a comic book character. Yeah, totally. In a way. When you look at his role in the upcoming uh, Central Intelligence with Kevin Hart, which I actually think looks really funny. It does look really funny. funny. I'm looking forward to seeing this. He's <clears throat> kind of a comic book character in many ways. He was born to play comic book characters. And I, I think this is, now look, he's starting to be in so much stuff because besides all the movies, he's, I believe he's still doing, what's that HBO show he's doing? Ballers. 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 Yep. Like, I think he's still got, he's doing Ballers. He's got like seven movies on the go and all this kind of stuff. And his Instagram feed is highly entertaining. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> I, I love very the active, Instagram very active. feed. It's right. <laughs> but I, you know what? I can't think of anybody else like that would come up higher on the list in my mind for who should play Doc Savage. And I remember when, he first came out and said a couple of months ago, when Shane Black came out and said a few months ago, I'm, I'm still thinking about Doc Savage, and the guy I'd like is this little, is this little actor named Dwayne Johnson, but he's so busy, we'll have to see if we can make it work. Apparently they found a way to work, make it work, and Doc Savage, I think, will now be on a lot more people's radars than it would have been otherwise. If this come out with the Doc Savage with unknown a actor, uh, Buck Rollins is, is playing Doc Savage, I don't know that a lot of people would have put it on their radar. No. Now it will, and I got to admit, Shane Black doing it? Yeah. I'm, I'm totally on board. And is it going to be a period piece? Is it going to be, that's what I'm curious about, is it going to be set Good in the question. 30s? You know what? It's funny because a lot of the Doc Savage uh, scripts that have been going around over the you know development hell have been period pieces, and the, oh, the desire has always been, can we update it somehow? Can we make it work? What are your thoughts, Amy? Well, I, I think this is tremendously exciting. Uh, I Like you said, I think it's going to put it on a lot of people's radars. Doc Savage can be one of those characters who's a victim of his own success in terms of being imitated by other characters who go on to become much more famous. Yeah. Even though he was like a huge deal at the time and had like a big second life when they, I guess they released a lot of the original pulp stories with new art in like the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another generation of fans that came out of that. Uh, I, I don't know. I think this is delightful, especially with Shane Black at the helm. We know that like we're, we're going to be able to laugh a little bit and have some cool action, and those things might not destroy each other, which would maybe <laughs> be your fear if you were looking at like a goofy Doc Savage. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it is a fully goofy Doc Savage, who would I pick other than Rock to do it? Like, right. And I do love a little bit, especially if it is a period piece, I like that they didn't feel the necessity to be like, well, we got to get a white dude. It's the 30s. Totally. Yeah. I, I love the casting, and especially like, you know, he's proven himself in Pain and Gain in movies like Faster. Uh, he's just, he's proven his ability to act. And then, I mean, that trailer for whatever that Kevin Hart, Central Intelligence, Central Intelligence 
just makes me laugh watching him me be too. an idiot. I mean, so it's like, it's so much fun. Like, he has that just instant personality. So, I mean, to see him play Doc Savage, you're absolutely right. That that's the that's made me want to see the film. So I hope too. I mean, I, I'm really getting into this whole idea of of the period, like Boardwalk Empire and and Peaky Blinders season three dropped last night, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm really enjoying modern depiction of period, mm -hmm. especially when they do things like they bring in modern music. Like it started with a Knight's Tale. Remember that movie, yes. Knight's Tale? Did not like it so much. I didn't, in the Knight's I didn't Tale. like it. Second time that's come up today. It was for a little me. goofy. It's a Tale day. Or you might even go back to Lady Hawk and say that the the uh, was it Alan Parsons did the the. the oh Alan yeah, Parsons with, with the, the Lady synth, all the score. synth music. Yeah, it was right. a, that was a, it didn't work so well there either. But I kind of no, liked some of it. No, Knight's Tale brilliant. You take that back. Okay, well, <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't. But I like. I mean, I think if they do a cool period piece, and you know, wouldn't it be cool to see like the Rocketeer? Like if they did a second. Doc Savage movie, bring in all those guys from the 30s. Bring the Phantom, bring the Shadow, well, bring you know, the Rocketeer. They've done that already. It's called Planetary, where they've literally, well, that comic was able to bring in all of those people, but, you know, obviously renamed and done in homage to those characters. What a fun, get that, you know, Planetary. I think I already did, like, you know, hey, it should be turned into a movie many, many weeks ago. Let's move on to what did get turned into a movie. It's called X-Men Apocalypse. There was an apocalypse at the box office, unfortunately. X-Men didn't do exactly what everybody wanted. It was the number one film, made $65 million, another 15 on Monday, so $80 million total. But much that was less, Fox's projection. Much, But it was much less than what was expected. They, they, they were saying, like, the three-day weekend minus Memorial Day, they were thinking 80, so it was like 65. Well, it's they were like hoping almost two. 70 worldwide 270 well million. robert you know let's just, just saying just mixed critical reviews aside from robert who loved it um there was you know everybody you know didn't love it uh there's a word of mouth effect to the box office, unfortunately. Brian Singer and Simon Kinberg have been very vocal about the upcoming X Men films. You've got New Mutants, you have Deadpool, you have X Force, you have Wolverine. All these films, especially Wolverine, is shooting right now in New Orleans. Uh, we've got two movies in Wolverine 3 locked into future release dates. They've been kind of, Fox has been moving these release dates forwards and backwards. We don't know what those films are going to be. What do you guys think is the smart move for the future of the X Men franchise? Let's start off with you, John. I, look, one thing is an anomaly, two things are a pattern, right? With the Brian Singer X-Men films, as far as, now, for those of you who heard us, you probably saw a review. Of, I liked X-Men Apocalypse, mm -hmm. but I also do think it was the worst of the Brian Singer uh, X-Men films. That's really more of a commentary of how excellent I think X-Men, X-Men 2, and X-Men Days of Future Past are. Um, so was this a little bit of a bump? Yeah, it was a bad marketing campaign. Look, we've been saying that for a long time. Right. Like, right from the first trailers, a lot of people were very iffy on the marketing campaign. When a lot of people were predicting 120 million, I said 84, or maybe I might have said 86 because the marketing campaign was not good. And I didn't think a lot of people were going to feel excited about it and it came around 60. Doing bonkers worldwide, though, you're pointing out already right. approaching $270 million worldwide already. So that's doing fine. But if we do want to look at it, let's for argument's sake say we're going to look at X-Men Apocalypse as a bump in the road, as maybe the first minor disappointment, even though I, I still enjoyed it, then it's one. Like, remember, the pattern so far is X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, excellent, excellent, bump in the road. I really don't think one film, regardless of how much we loved it or how much we didn't, I don't think one film should cause Fox to recoil and go, oh my God, what we do. This isn't a Fantastic Four situation right. where they crap the bed again, and now that's the fourth time in a row right. they've crapped the bed with Fantastic Four. Then you go, we need to rethink our life choices here. That's right. But with this, even, even though it's not a big monumental hit, the critics are almost completely evenly spit. It's got like a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. Half like it, half don't. Fine. It's one film. Now, New Mutants comes out. Deadpool 2 comes out. The next X-Men comes out. The next Wolverine comes out. And you get a couple in a row that become questionable. Then Fox needs to take a step back. But as of right now, I think it's a bump in the road. I don't think they need to change their plans at all. Amy, how about you? Uh, pretty much the same. It It is a bump in the road. I, I haven't discussed my response to the movie too much. I, I was a bit disappointed with it. I wanted it to be better than it was. I, I know I'm a little too close to some of these characters, but I'm usually pretty good at setting that aside for the sake of watching X-Men movies. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not like they have so much great material here. Like I really like their new cast of X-Kids. Mm. Um, the, the one thing that this movie made me like if I knew I was immediately getting another movie with these X kids, I might have even liked it more right. because I could treat it more as just set up for like what is begun at the very end of this movie. I'm into that thing that they started where they're like, yeah, train these people. Let me see more of them. Um, so yeah, no movie can really 
is that much of a failure if it let left me going i want to see more of them right uh, right. So they have that they have that opportunity to work with. I, I don't know how it fits in with their plans of massive things. And yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just hoping this was a you can't necessarily knock it out of the park every single time. Before we get to Robert, I just want to mention you, you brought that up, how they show the, you know, the, you know, this is a slight spoiler. Put a spoiler thing up, please. <laughs> Put that little spoilery. <laughs> Spoiler alert. spoiler alert. All right, I'm going to spoil some shit. So don't don't get all weird about it. Um, The ending of the movie. X-Men Apocalypse has the new team that they introduce. And I thought the introduction of all those new characters was great and spot on. Does I Storm have a name? Storm? Yeah. Do they say her name? I don't think so. I don't think they ever say Aurora at all. No. You're right. Or Storm? Nor, nor do they say Storm. Yeah. Right. yeah. Just checking. No, yeah. no. You're right. You're right. So there's a, a, there's problems in the movie. But, but that they introduced Scott Summers. I love Scott her so Summers. much and she was great and she can Scott Summers was introduced really well. I love the yeah. introduction to the new Jean Grey. I like all the new the new, new Nightcrawler and the new Storm, even yeah. though they didn't mention her. I think introducing all those characters and seeing them at the end, you know, about to you know hit some danger room stuff, it felt like I've seen that ending already. Mm. They already ended a movie. That I think it was one of the X Men films with them. All right, now let's train, and then it ends, yep. and you then you don't get anything. And I I'm with you on like. I like this film quite a quite a, a lot. I'd give it like a seventy, almost a, maybe a seventy five out of a hundred. Where I think the ending is what pulled the whole movie apart for me i thought they had all the right elements but then you know the whole apocalypse thing just didn't add up and a lot of things just didn't work out but that new the new x-men were my favorite part of the film and they were barely in it and that they tease you at the end with like now they're going to be training i'm like now i have to wait another five years come on the just other thing make about one. that training ending was that not only did it come from another X-Men movie, it kind of, we kind of saw that in uh, Avengers Age of Ultron where it ends with, yes. with the new teams yes. assembled there, Sorry. except at the head of it, you had Captain America. Yeah. <laughs> at this one, you have an actress who doesn't even want to be there playing a character who should never be considered the head of the X-Men. <laughs> so that was, I, I was not thrilled with that there, shot. There's some, yeah. So, I mean, overall, let's get, all right, spoiler ending, go to pull it, all right, we're done. <laughs> all right, Robert, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think you got to put the spoiler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hang on. No, no, no. Wait, wait, yeah, are you <laughs> sure? Okay. All right. Okay, I just want to say, I mean, for, if, if nothing else. Wait, well, are if, you going to spoil or not? Yeah, I was going to say a spoiler right, thing. Okay. Well, if nothing else. When you get to see Jean Grey go the full Phoenix, oh, it's I awesome. mean that was, was I love there, that shot. See, to me, there's so much in this movie that okay, I'm not gonna spoil spoil anything more. Mm -hmm. There, there's so much in this movie that I like being a comic fan. The thing about the X Men is they've always fought other people. Mm -hmm. You know, Magneto is a dude. Uh, Kevin Bacon was a dude, was a guy, and I think that Apocalypse is so other to this franchise. We'd never introduced a character who really is kind of in a fog. Like, I would love to have seen more made of him, maybe traveling around the world, looking at the modern age. I don't think we got enough of who he was right. and what his relationship to his horsemen, why did he need them? Right. You know, and, and I think I wanted to see more of that. But he was such an interesting villain to me, like how, you know, he shows up, he lived in the cradle of civilization, the height of human achievement back in the day. In, in ancient Egypt. And then he shows up in Egypt now. And it's kind of a shithole. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, what is this place? What? This used to be such this beautiful the Nile basin. It was gorgeous. We had the technology of the age. We had aqueducts. Everything was beautiful. <laughs> People were beautiful. The buildings were beautiful. The sun was shining. And look at this dirty, gross, horrible. What are these combustion engines? Like, what is all this? But Storm is a Star Trek fan, so I did like that. She was watching. <laughs> she was watching the second season episode. Who mourns for Adonais? Uh, but anyway, I, I I think the movie's going to do fine. It hasn't opened in China yet. Right. And look, if it does something comparable, it costs less than Days of Future Past. Right. So if it if it if it does six hundred million worldwide total, that's a respectable. Now, oh yeah, that would be great. Is it too soon now? Like th just yesterday, they released so Brian Singer's saying he's going to take a break or step away from the X Men for a minute. I I think it's like he's doing a great job with the X Men. I think I like. Most of the X Men films, almost, I, I, it's not like I dislike this film. Every X Men film he's done, especially Days of Future Past, which I still think is the best one of the ones he's directed. Uh, me too. Um, this one just had a bunch of missteps, and I agree completely with you. They all revolve around Apocalypse, and I think the storyline and his 
identity as a character, giving him some kind of something to chew on. He's just like a dude floating around. I was like, oh, I want to end everything. He's like I'm, uh, uh, the Joker, but with none of the character. He's like, I'm a mi I'm on a mission of chaos. He didn't even have a cool accent. He's just like mm, floating around with weird eyes. Well, that was the thing. He needed a little Hans Gruber. Yes. We, we needed to see the Hans Gruber yes. version of Apocalypse. He you needed know, to be a character. I am an exceptional thief, madam. Explain what it is he's objecting to and sort of why. Like, And it's not, there's good comic book precedent for Apocalypse being a dumb villain who doesn't make a lot of sense. So in that, like, everyone's making jokes about, like, well, it felt just like an Apocalypse story. And they have a point. But it doesn't mean, as we talked about, that you can't, there are people out there who have the capacity for cruelty or who want to sort of like think that compassion is weakness. There are real people like that and you can put words in their mouth that make them the larger than life menacing mm. version of that. But it was watching the movie, you're not exactly clear what it is that he hates and objects to and is exactly. going for. And right. that could have been more clarity there and much more clarity in his relationship with the horseman I think would have helped me a lot. Yeah, yeah, the other yeah. thing too that I loved about Apocalypse, I love this thing about Apocalypse so much, he had, throughout the entire movie, in every scene, he had ascending volume syndrome, which is basically every single line, every single scene he had, if you're saying, I'm gonna go to the 7-Eleven, buy a hot dog, and maybe a Slurpee, and then come back to the office. The way he says is, I'm going to the 7-Eleven to buy a hot dog and a Slurpee, and then come back to the office! <laughs> every line was ascending That's volume, right. every single time. It was like, wow. That's true, and then they had a follow-up question, then he would start out really low again. <laughs> then <they'd come> <laughs> no, but it needs, I, I, I think that the, the thing about these films is they're only as good as the villains. And the, the thing is, the human villains have been so charismatic in this mm. franchise. I mean, even yeah, Kevin Bacon was great. Yeah. He was great. You hated him. You absolutely hated him, but you knew why you hated him. You didn't mind when that coin went somewhere. No. Oh, no, you, you were, you were yeah. cheering You were waiting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like Game of Thrones. How many people want to see Ramsey Bolton die? I mean, take Everyone. a poll. In, in the history of fiction, <laughs> how long history, do they want to see him die? I mean, I thought I wanted, I thought I wanted, you know, Joffrey? little Joffrey to die. I thought <laughs> his I death was too quick. I have never <laughs> wanted to see someone die as much, and I hope I it is way too quick. I yeah. want, hey, I want, I just want a whole episode where I can just watch Ramsey Bolton crucified, and I'll just watch. I for think an he's going to get flayed alive by. But, but who's going to do it? I think the one who got flayed. You think oh, uh, Reek? Fion. Reek. Reek. Fion's Fion. going to come back. I think and, so. Some people think it'll be Sansa. It might be by Sansa, but I really do think it's going to be Reek. I, I think, think it'll be it's so be much better if it was Reek. Yeah. Piece by piece. I wonder what Apocalypse is. <laughs> <laughs> Hang, Hang on. We've we're literally we're been we're distracted we're from the subject of the X-Men movie. Game of Thrones is destroying yeah. everything. What do you think him? Apocalypse would do in Westeros? Uh, oh, he would rule. Yeah. <laughs> He'd get that dragon. He'd have a couple of dire wolves around, you know? All right. Let's stop talking about X-Men. You know, Go see X-Men Apocalypse. It's definitely worth seeing in the theater. It's a giant, big film. It's got a lot of really cool things going for it. Some not so cool things going for it. But it definitely continues the X-Men franchise, I think, in a positive way because we have all these new X-Men. Just get that movie going. I want to see it next year with all the new X-Men. So literally, we've got a lot of X-Men movies, new mutants. Just get another X-Men movie going. Just make it happen. Just that's all. We, that's all I want. The Dark so. Phoenix trilogy. Yeah. Well, I mean, three movies. Shoot them all at once, could, like Lord of the Rings. I don't want to see. Yeah, I don't want to wait five years. That's the whole thing. Is she, that's the thing that irks me about these uh, certain superhero films when they're like, we don't really have a plan. We're doing Deadpool, and we're just like, you just set all this cool stuff up. When you float away for another four years, just make it. That's why they do the Dark Phoenix saga as a trilogy at once. All right, take I'm with a page, you. Peter Jackson. Listen <laughs> to Burnett. I want to see that happen. No one ever does. You know what I don't want to see happen is Lex Luthor showing up in Justice Aww. League. That's right. Jesse Eisenberg let people know over the weekend uh, at the MCM Comic-Con that Lex Luthor is indeed returning to the Justice League, uh, currently in production. Ping, 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 ping. How's it going? Amy, what are your thoughts about <laughs> Jesse Eisenberg returning to the DC franchise? Well, I mean, it's the, it's the immediate next piece of the, the the real like interconnected DC universe so it'd be a little odd if we didn't see at least something of him yep. in it uh, so in that sense like the big question is how much of a role is he likely to have or is it just going to be like we're going to visit him in jail right um, so in that sense like yeah I, it'd be a little weird to just forget that like Luthor exists in your first Justice League movie I don't know definitely agree sense. how about you John I'm one of these rare creatures. I like Jesse Eisenberg as, as Lex. I did. Just for the record, too, at the end, it's not ping ping. It is, he talks about ringing the, the dinner bell's been wrong. It's ding ding, ding ding. Does that change your perception of the movie now? No. Okay, didn't think so. I, th I still think it's ping ping. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's ding ding because the dinner bell's been wrong. But anyway, 
Um, I'm one of the few guys that I liked. I thought it was a very different Lex Luthor. Um, absolutely. But by the end of it, when you realize the genius behind the maniac and all that kind of stuff, and I agree, even as somebody who's defending him as Lex Luthor, the way that final scene with Batman in the prison was done was very odd. Like even as a defender of this, his character, I thought that was very odd. But aside from that, so, but what Amy said is absolutely right. It would, it only makes sense that he comes back. You set him up as this, he is Lex Luthor. To not have him in the next film would be very strange, mm -hmm. uh, if anything. And you know, so for good or for bad, they've made their bed with this character and who he is. For me, it worked. For some people, it didn't work, and that's cool. But they've made their bed with it, and now they got to sleep in it. And let's just hope that they can evolve it and make it better so that those of us who did like it like it even more, and those who didn't maybe get on board with it. And that's all we can ask for at this point. Definitely. How about you, Robert? Well, you know, I'm, I'm with you, John. I mean, I, I really did like Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. I like the different uh, way he played him. I think he suffered probably the most from what was cut out of the movie. Mm. And I'm back to you. I think the ding ding, the ping ping, is referring to the <laughs> mother box. Yes. You know, that he's heard... You, you've seen... All that scene with Steppenwolf and the three mother bosses, that was cut out of the movie. That was cut out of the movie. It's insane. I mean, it's he's awesome. referring to and it that. It was so short. It's not like it saved them five right. minutes. Right. It was of one minute, and it was, and like, it was awesome. But they don't. They don't again, again, studio notes are like, well, it, it, this is the problem when you get studio notes. The notes are, you you need to lose this. It's usually things that the studio heads or the studio executives, because I've been on the receiving end mm -hmm. of that. I I got notes from HBO, and it's things that they don't get. Like if they don't understand Steppenwolf and the mother box, like oh, cut that out. What is that? And you're like, the people that know what it is, it's such a weird game to play. Right. And I think when we see this, I watched uh, the director's cut of Watchmen, not the one with the animation, not the ultimate right. cut, but the director's cut of Watchmen. And it, it was served so well with the added material that they put back that should have always been in the film. Right. And I think that's the case with Superman, uh, Batman v Superman. I think we're going to see that even with that 30 minutes. I think people are going to like Jesse Eisenberg's performance a lot more because they probably took out a lot of the the sort of connective tissue you need to understand his portrayal all that's left is the crazy well i'll i, I mean, agree I'll, with what you I mean, both we'll are see, saying maybe. well i'll wait and see I, I don't know how 30 minutes is gonna make that movie work for me but i want to see that full you know I, whatever hmm. everyone's talking about like a four-hour cut i'm like whatever i would see any cut that wasn't the cut that they released in the theater i know i agree with you um Eisenberg I mean, just didn't do it for me. I, I I didn't like the way he portrayed Lex Luthor. It's all those weird mannerisms, and I mean, my entire life I've I've grown up, you know, and seen Lex Luthor in many different iterations, from television to comics to movies, and they've always been different. And this one was different, and just went a different like a different way that I didn't like. And so I'm hoping that with the course correction that they're going with Justice League, they've got Jeff Johns, they've got Ben Affleck as an executive producer, that they might be able to course correct that character a little bit at least for some of the people who didn't like him. I agree, they'll probably just have a scene with him in jail, but he is setting up the, the, the coming of Darkseid, the coming of Apocalypse. Not X-Men Apocalypse, but the DC version of Apocalypse. So, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see, you know? I, I guess I knew that he was gonna be in the movie. You're like, they're not just gonna not address Lex Luthor. You know, so we'll see what happens. He got shivved in prison. It's <laughs> right. That's right. I wonder if he gets his own. Tonight. Yeah. Does he get his own logo, like an LL logo? Like does Lex Corp well, his, have? You know, his team that did all the other logos for all That's Aquaman I mean. and Wonder Woman on his little. They did all the logos. So he probably has a little LL. You're right. I mean, he's we'll already got that. the Lex Corp logo, but yes. he needs now. He's in jail and he's been incarcerated. I think he just used 99 designs for that. I think he just <laughs> hopped online. And Fiber. Hey, Fiber. I need a Wonder Woman design. <laughs> a what? Uh, yeah. Just trust me. Go with it. Well, let's rock on into some of the most controversial comic book news that happened just last week. I'm not talking about DC Rebirth, which was actually really fun and a kind of a cool, unexpected way to bring a brand new uh, flavor to DC's constantly rebooting universe. I actually liked it. So that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about this week. Captain America is working for Hydra. What? Hail Hydra! That one panel, that last splash page at the very end freaked out anyone who's ever read Captain America all over the planet. People are freaking out. Um, the comic shakeup in the newest Captain America, which we see Steve Rogers betray his team and say, hail Hydra in the last panel. This went all around the world. The writers got death threats. They even threatened Ed Brubaker and he has nothing to do with this. People are just <laughs> angry. There's so much anger trollness going on. Every sing single person is getting you know, called out like, who dared to do this? I'm gonna kill you. So everyone's got their opinions. Uh, you know, especially on Heroes, we're all going to weigh in on it. 
Um, will it affect the films? What does all this mean? Is, is Captain America a double secret triple agent? So let me start this one off. I say this is this has happened throughout all of history. It's it's awesome when it happens, and you guys all just got sucked into it. You got played like the suckers. Captain America is not a double agent working for Hydra. There's a twist that is coming in this series, and everyone's being very reactionary. Remember when Superman died? That was in 1993. There was this big event. It went all around the world. There's like people lined up around these comic book shops that have never even read a comic. They're like, I heard soup. They're killing Superman. That's right. He got killed by a creature named Doomsday. Sounds familiar, right? Batman v Superman. Check it out. This was 1993 in the comics. They killed Superman. Four other Superman showed up. They had Steel, Superboy. The, Krypton the Kryptonian. The Krypton yeah. The, the, so they had four other dudes operating in the four other comics. That rocked on for a little while. And then what happened? Superman came back. He had a black outfit. He had long hair. He had long hair. Blue lightning. That's right. Well, that's, Somebody that was, was sharing later. the writer's yeah. column the two with one of those yeah. redesigns. Um, and it was kind of funny because we've been talking about like internet hate and it was a letters column from one of those Superman costume redesigns where it was them being like, you idiots have ruined Superman. <laughs> I will not read this until you right. change it back. And I it's will. just yeah. And eventually they changed it back. So, I mean, look, this is, happens in comics all the time. They killed the Human Torch. They killed so many because they wouldn't give them a bank loan. They killed so many people in comic books and they've done this kind of thing all the time. This is just a different way of like changing it up I honestly do not believe that Captain America has been a double agent or a, you know, working for Hydra the whole time. Do you want to I, hear my theory? Yes. Do you have a theory? Let's, that's, that's my feeling. I think it's just a big and a very smart and awesome marketing ploy by Marvel. Look at all the people who got sucked into believing this and are filled with weird anger for no reason. Amy, what's your theory? <laughs> well, this is, this is super spoilers uh, for the first issue, but. We're, Wait a minute. Should you put up a spoiler <laughs> tag? We, we already showed the No, that's too late. The, the <laughs> Take that spoiler yes. thing away. Um, if you don't know that Captain America is a double agent, you can't be possibly watching Collider Heroes. Well, Went and, all around the world. And this next part can't be a spoiler because it's a guess. But having read the first issue, it looks as if uh, like someone has traveled through time to change his past um, in order to... Uh, it, it, that's just like there's nice. a mysterious woman who shows up uh, when when Steve's a kid and sort of talks to his mom and like takes her to dinner and come like, to a Hydra meeting. Yeah. Yes. Literally. Uh, uh, and so they, they do a thing with the coloring where like she's got these weird red accents in a mostly black and white background. Mm. And it just and there's some things she says to him that's like, I bet you're going to grow up real brave. Um, and it, there are these little tells of like. Maybe he's a Hydra agent. Was that always true? Has somebody monkeyed around with the timeline? That being said, like, I, I don't know. I got to, like, death threats are crazy. Don't do it. What are you thinking? But people who find the storyline uncomfortable because, like, while, while a twist where you work for your worst enemy is perfectly standard comic book stuff, because Hydra, while not explicitly Nazism, has a long history of being linked to fascist ideologies, there are people who are like, this idea makes me uncomfortable. And I kind of respect that. Mm -hmm. Even in this issue, they show you a scene of like a Hydra recruiter using sort of weird right-wing dialogue to get like a, a dispossessed person on his side. And it's actually this really interesting sympathetic portrayal of like getting sucked into these hate movements. Right. So they're very aware that that's the thing they're talking about. Uh, and I can't really blame someone who's like, this is not for me. I don't want to look at an alternate version where Cap believes this even for a second. On the other hand, you are right. It's totally normal comic book stuff. Okay, Robert? sorry. I had a lot to say on no, that. No, no, no. Thank you for stuff. sharing that, Robert. Uh, I'm, I'm with you 100% on this. I mean, anyone, look, even in Star Trek, they changed the past when space Nazis in, in Enterprise, you know, the, the, yesterday's Enterprise when the, the universe gets changed and the Klingons are beating the Federation in a war. This is, this is old school comic book storytelling at its finest. Have people never read a comic book? It's like in Miami I do Vice. Have the implication that anyone who's mad hasn't read comics because there's well, a lot of that going around. Well, no, it's like, true, okay, but, not... but I mean, you, you, it's the anyone who's ever read a comic in the sense that, in terms of changing the past and the present day, the age of apocalypse. You know, when apocalypse takes over, there's such also, a long tradition in Marvel comics. I think you're right, actually. Somebody goes back in time. What a great twist! Right. I mean, it's like you know, in Alpha Flight, when you find out what really happened to Guardian, you know, Vindicator. Horrible. I mean, I liked it. Really? I did. <laughs> but anyway. Alpha Flight fight. Anyway, I, I was just like, how can you get upset about this? I, you know what? I want to read the next issue, and that was the point. You know, you know, want people to come back into the comic book store. Last week, more people were talking about comic books 
in the media, yeah. in the press than <clears throat> ever before between DC Rebirth and Captain America being a Hydra agent. I mean, it isn't that great? It was on CNN's front page. Yeah. It's great for the whole industry. Yeah. And why Why is fandom, why wouldn't you embrace that? Like, I don't get, whenever they did something major like this, I always loved it. It's you know, when rock changing it up a little bit. The only difference is you didn't actually see it happen. Like normally, even in, in, in uh, City on the Edge of Forever, when they jump through, when McCoy jumps through the Garden of Forever and the Enterprise disappears, you actually saw that happen. Well, here's, in this case, you haven't seen Here's another what point happened. before we get to you, John. I wanted to say, like, what you brought up is very true. It's like people want to change things when it's like, look, Captain America represents one thing for most of us Americans. That's He is like an embodiment of the virtual values that we all believe to be American. To see that taken away and perhaps now he's always represented fascism is a blow to our ego and to also the character that we love and respect so just imagine how much better it's going to be when he gets his timeline back when he becomes the real captain america again that's he's going to have to obviously fight for it and other heroes are going to have to come like this isn't how it's supposed to be i think you're 100 percent right i hope you are because that's a great time rift type of a thing but that's when comic books when the, the idea of of being able to go into time rifting and changing characters that's when you see these really cool stories happen and that's what I think we're in the middle of that kind of a story John what do you think this is where it gets interesting because if you look at uh, Daredevil if you look at Killing Joke if you look at The Flash and Zoom on TV right all three of them had a scene come up where the one person who's the darker person says to the lighter person you are just one bad day away from being me mm. most famously said by the Joker but right. they said it again in Daredevil they said it in The Flash I think what's interesting about the storyline is that if it is, and I agree with your your theory, if it is a matter of someone going back in time, look, our destinies could have been radically shifted. There's a little bit of butterfly effect too, that if one thing went wrong or one other thing could have gone right, and now you separate us by 20 years, our lives could be totally different. We could be completely different people. And to me, when I read this, I saw like a thought bubble that wasn't really there it says, you're all just one bad day away from being Captain America as a Hydra agent. But at the same time, the last time we got this type of media attention over a story twist in a comic book was earlier this year when it got revealed in a Star Wars comic book, Han Solo's got a wife. Remember that? Right. It was on CNN's right. front page. He's running around <laughs> with Princess Leia when he's got a wife and blah, blah. And I said then what basically what it is you're saying now, Schnapp, I said at the time, look, in a couple of issues they're going to reveal they were never actually married. She's a little bit crazy. And it's not a real marriage, blah, blah. And sure enough, that's what happened. At some point here, you should all know well enough that these, these radical twists in the storylines, these are all majorly temporary. Uh, this will be course corrected soon enough. It'll be a part of a storyline. But to the question that you brought up, but how does this affect the movies? Where does this come in, involved in playing the movies? Are we now going to see Chris Evans you know, stand side by side uh, with uh, Agent Smith. I keep forgetting his name, the actor. <laughs> the Red Skull. Um, yeah. uh, the Red Skull, standing side by side with the Red Skull. No. Remember, they, they've already often talked about this before. It's like, just because something happened in a comic that has been running for 60 years. <laughs> That's right. Doesn't mean this movie franchise, which has been running for about five since uh, the first Avengers came out. Mm -hmm. We like we got way more stories. We've got 20 more years of Captain America, just as the Captain America we know and love, right. to come before we get to this stuff. I don't think this move in this particular storyline is going to impact the movies whatsoever. But I did want to tell them, for those of you who have not seen it, uh, can you bring up that picture once again of Captain America and the Hail Hydra thing? So in this picture of Captain America, we see in that dark background, right? Some wonderful, funny artist took that same picture, except they put different superheroes over Captain America. So you still that, see that bad background and at the top look this up online you can find this is great it's got captain america saying hail hydra under that you see daredevil going i could see the whole time under that you see spider-man saying fuck responsibility under that it's 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 uh deadpool saying i hate chimichangas and my favorite one it's batman going i shot my parents yeah <laughs> it's like, and that's that great. they're all redrawn as like similar that exact same kind of panel but they just kind of traced over it yeah it's, it's hilarious it's a great meme that's done. going around but you know i, I think what's What's really disturbing, and you, you pointed this out, is when did fandom, like if I read this when I was say in high school, when I was buying comics and I was, you know, stacks of them every week, high school and college, mm -hmm. this would have been to me like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Electrifying. Electrifying, you're like, what's gonna happen what's next? next? Like why, I, I just don't understand how anybody- It would anybody, not be death threats. Any, yeah, anybody who follows comic books and follows this kind of entertainment, 
this would be the this would be should be the beginning of an awesome story, a, a story that is unexpected, right. a story that gets elicits an emotional response, like all great stories should. Why are people angry about this? I don't know. Like bad stories make you angry. If you end up disliking this, it'll make you angry. I didn't like the Flashpoint version of Wonder Woman. I didn't give anyone any death threats, but I thought that that was an alternate universe take on someone that was not a great tribute to who she is as a character. But that I would have done it differently. Like my my boss at the comic book store, when they killed Jean Grey, he tore his comic into bits. There's nothing new about hating decisions that people make in fiction. But I think the reactionary element is what Robert is saying. Is there's such a giant reaction for people, most of the people who've never picked up one Captain America comic in their life. <laughs> now granted, if you did and are a Captain America fan and this bothered you and you hate the idea, I think you have every right to, but like at the same time, let the story play out. But you, you bring up a right great to... point. You bring up a great point that I don't think we're addressing here a, a lot is that a lot of the people who reacted, the reason it made the front cover of CNN is not because of all those hundreds of millions of Captain America comic book readers is because of all those people out there who have never picked up a Captain America right. comic book, who are the majority of people out there, mm -hmm. but who are attached to the character because of the movies. And this is a very uncomfortable state for some people. Captain America doesn't belong to the comic books anymore. Captain America has transcended the comic. Now, he doesn't belong exclusively to the movies. He doesn't ex belong exclusively to the television. He's transcended any single medium of the thing. And I think what you're seeing is, I think a lot of the comic book fans and readers, I'm reading some griping, but I think a lot of them have the attitude of, ah, we see all these stories get rewritten, right. history's changed, rebooting, 52 just got scrapped, now we're heading into the new beginnings, blah, blah, blah. no big deal. I think for the most part, the people you see freaking out, the reason it's on the front of Fox and mm -hmm. on the front of CNN, is all those people reacting to Chris Evans right. saying, Hail Hydra, and now they're all freaking out. about. I think the comic ones are a little bit more grounded yeah well, enough, well but because we've seen it happen again and again so and, many and, times and we like we actually uh, like hey we appreciate changes and and changing up characters like remember captain america if you don't know had quit being captain america many many like times, times over like the you know four <laughs> or five decades he was a he became a character called nomad for about two or three years and somebody else was playing cap the, then he was a usa u.s agent for yep. a little while there was a weird storyline where they treated the super serum as a drug and tried to do like a drug addiction storyline there's the which i thought was interesting period <laughs> the there's... infamous werewolf period well, that's I, right i think though you know the ire that has shown up online is a, a it, it's a symptom of something larger that's happening in this country mm -hmm. i think people like hatred Mm. I really think we've we we now live in an era where if you're if you're triggered, if you're made angry, everybody is sort of waiting oh, to be offended. No, everybody loves being, being outraged. Offended. But I think That's I think but I think they. Uh, but here's what, what I mean to say is, I think that people like outrage. Yes. They like feeling angry. Okay, there's never been a time in human history where self-righteous anger wasn't popular. Of, of yeah. course, <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I think I think that right now people enjoy it. Hmm. I think people are enjoying their anger. You're and saying they're enjoying it more than before, and I think what you're also saying, if I'm going to read into Righteous it, righteous indignation is one thing, but well, I think we, people want to feel something. But we also they, have Twitter, and we have the ability to like instantly. That's a much bigger change. That's yeah. the, we mm -hmm. can instantly react, and that's what I'm saying is everyone I think is good being a little too reactionary about a comic book, and especially a comic book. They're character. being reactionary about everything. Now look, look at our Captain, politics. Captain America. I love the Captain America movies. It's everything that I've ever believed Captain America is is embodied in those three films. It's a it's a it's an incredible series of films. Like hats off to Marvel for making such a great. Captain America, he's he's more popular than Superman now. No one ever thought that would actually <laughs> happen. Yeah, that's but weird. Think actually, about that, yeah. Superman's just some brooding weird dude in a rainy metropolis who doesn't want to, he's a crybaby Superman who wants to go away. And instead you have Captain America who embodies everything that we aren't anymore. He embodies the American dream and the things that America should be. It well, should be. All the things that he constantly says it should be in those films. It's not the America that we live in right now. And so I think that's what's hurting all the outside people who don't really read comics, they're reacting to like, that's the Captain America that I want to see. He's the, he is the American dream. Don't you dare make him a Nazi or a fascist. So it's a reactionary thing that we're seeing hit all across the world. People are reacting because we have these little devices that we can spread our anger. Well, so. I, look, what you said is absolutely true. I think the way that Chris Evans has portrayed Steve Rogers in the movies has, has become the definitive portrayal of Captain America for most people yeah. and 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 as by extension it's basically the portrayal of what we want to believe america should be when we're not that way right. i mean in the real world right 
and the fact that Hail Hydra became a meme. Right. You know, <laughs> after after Winter Soldier, everybody was saying Hail Hydra. You see it all over the internet when sure. someone whispers into somebody else's it's ear, no matter what it is. Hail Hydra. It's always <laughs> Hail Hydra. You know, no matter what it is. <laughs> and I think it's become, you, you know, uh, there's something going on in our in our country right now. The divisive nature of this election cycle and everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. We are are living in a, in an era where I think we desperately want to return to that America that we once believed in, right. which is what Chris Evans embodies. And I think we're moving further and further away from that America, although people don't know how or why this is happening. Right. They just know that we're on some spiral. It's like an expanding universe of crazy weirdness where we got to come back. We have to contract right. back to the America that was. And I think that that's what this is, that people are responding to. If, you're gonna, if, if the last vestige of America is stripped away, if Captain America is taken away, what are we as a nation? But I want to say, highlight something that you said, but I think got got buried under a lot of the other things you said. It is the most important and, and important part about this whole thing. The reaction we're seeing is exactly what Marvel wanted. Yeah. This yes, was the reaction is. they wanted to get. Not the this death is, threat parts. This, no, no, not the death threat parts <laughs> to a degree. But I think they knew. Passion, that, yes. Yes, they wanted to. They wanted to incite. I think they wanted to provoke, mm -hmm. and they wanted to get everybody in the world talking about this thing, which is what we're doing right now. That's right. It, this is exactly. They were what like, they "DC designed. Rebirth is coming out when? Let's yeah. drop this <laughs> mega bomb." All we're talking about is Hail hey. Hydra now. Yeah, yeah. and like, I, and you know what? I think both of the both those comic book uh, franchise, those corporations, did a great job with like with the DC Rebirth. I think I think, you know, it might piss off a lot of people that Doc Manhattan is involved in this kind of stuff. It, but you know weird thing just to follow up because someone did ask after last week and I was like I haven't had a chance to read it yet uh, I don't think I'm ever going to be okay with the idea of them being involved but the execution of that F F issue was fantastic exactly I agree with you I'm we'll still I'm, I'm on both sides which is horrible <laughs> I'm in the in between universe which hasn't been Join built yet what we need to remember though is is that as fans of this material we're getting great stuff yeah. I mean, there's the promise of, of isn't great comic books, isn't DC Rebirth and this new Captain America what we want as superhero fans? We want to be galvanized and inspired to read more. And if people are, that have never walked into a comic book store, I need to pick up between who's writing Black Panther now and right. Captain America. There's, we're, I think we might be in the midst of a comic book renaissance we haven't seen since the mid-80s. We're opening pull lists at a, a very fast rate. Uh, but yeah. I would always be rather... I'd rather be opening them for Black Panther because people hear it's amazing than for Cap because people are getting death threats so there's a balance to be sought there between is. good publicity and i don't know i have mixed feelings I, I i i'm with you guys you know what deserves a lot of publicity right now it's james cameron's <laughs> battle angel that's right they've been talking about this thing for years rosa salazar is alita battle angel the much talked about manga comics adaptation has found its alita in the actress rosa salazar she was in a uh, maze runner and a couple of these divergent films the film is going to be directed by robert rodriguez it's produced by james cameron who's also currently busy directing four consecutive avatar sequels he loves these movies with a and t you got terminator you got aliens you got avatar now you got alita battle angel all right now i will admit i have not read this comic book manga but now i'm so excited to actually pick it up and check it out i did a little research there's like three giant stories that you know cameron did a pick very well i have to say if he was like if i can't get ghost in the shell i'm getting this one and he grabbed this this science fiction future noir almost like 20 years ago yeah a long time ago he's been sitting on it for a while because he said we don't have the technology yet to be able to make this film now we have that technology I don't know who's writing the script. I don't know if he wrote the script himself. I certainly hope he did or had a hand in writing the script because he does great screenplays. And I think picking Robert Rodriguez is a good choice. Robert Rodriguez had a lot of misses recently, but he's an incredible director and he's on the always on the cusp of special effects and emerging technologies and figuring out ways to work within those. I know Cameron and Rodriguez were, were going to do heavy metal together. That fell apart. So those guys, just them probably talking and meeting each other, got that that wheel going i think it could be a perfect match what do you think have you checked out battle angel i actually haven't read battle angel Alita. uh its reputation precedes it. Mm -hmm. it a lot of people are very fond of it and the ideas and people involved seem very exciting but i don't have much of a uh, actual stake in the property well i'm gonna be probably buying it at house of secrets <laughs> later just checking it out uh, robert what do you think well, you know, I'm really excited. I'm surprised we haven't had the online ire that that once again an Asian actress has been replaced by a Hispanic actress. Mm. I've actually this. seen some discussion of that, but, uh, uh, it, but the character's a cyborg. It's unclear what ethnicity right, she's supposed to have. Right, right. And I, I, I've always thought that 
for, for me, that's never really, it's never mattered. I, you know, I, I've never cared about that kind of thing unless, of course, I do care, which <laughs> sometimes I change my mind. Right. Like, damn it, you cannot make a Kira and have it set in the United States. No, no, no. So you do get it. But, but it's just, well, it's just weird because so much of, of Asian fantasy, uh, whether it's manga, whether it's movies, is so steeped in that culture. That culture is as much a part of the project as anything else. And if you, like Akira, it has a very Japanese bent to it. And I don't think if you take it out of that, it's not as cool. Plus, I don't think any American could scream Kaneda or Tetsuo <laughs> the way they can in that no, movie. Never. But anyway, I, I'm excited. I think this is a really interesting choice. Uh, it is nice to see uh, this this actress get another role like this, and maybe we'll it'll be a breakout role for her, and she'll be a new you know. In five years, we'll have posters of Battle Angel Alita on all our walls. Sure, I, mean, hope I think so. it's great. I, I'm excited. You know, I hope that I hope Robert Rodriguez really takes his time. I think he needs. A breakthrough film, a really, I mean, he makes his films, they're all made at Troublemaker Studios. Right. He's making them for not a lot of money. I'd love to see him make this on par with other big budget sci fi blockbusters, and he'll have his breakthrough Matrix Definitely. moment. That he How has about you, that. John? What do you think? Uh, I, I, I'll say it. Robert Rodriguez is not a good director. Sorry, he's not. Uh, I, I got a friend of mine who's a producer who had just lined up Robert Rodriguez to work on his film, and I was like, Oh, hey, great. And then the news came that he departed that thing to go and work on Battle Angel instead. Mm. And I, then I said, dude, honestly, look, I'm so glad that happened because I got to tell you, I think he just dodged a bullet. I, I was, the last good movie he did was Planet Terror, which who would have guessed that the, the half of Grindhouse that was the better half would have been Robert Rodriguez's <laughs> half instead of Quentin Tarantino's half. That'll never happen again, but it did happen. But since then, what has he given us? He's given us machete, bag of shit. Spy Kids, all the time in the world in 4D, bag of shit. Machete kills, bag of shit. Sin City, a dame to kill for, bag of shit. I'm sorry, you can only do so many. Remember I said, if um, if uh, if this new one is, if this new X-Men is, is considered a bump in the road, it's not gonna, it's one thing in a row. I just listed off five bags of shit. I'm sorry, I have no faith in Robert Rodriguez as a director anymore. He knocked out a couple of really cool indie things that inspired an entire generation of indie filmmakers and he should never lose his credit for that in what he did. I'm sorry though. I don't care. Now, 2016, you put Robert Rodriguez's name on as a director, I'm going to enter the film skeptical. I'll go in with an open mind and, and hopefully enjoy it and love it. But I'm sorry, he is, he is just, he has earned the loss of respect at this point. So I am very, very critical of this move and I am not as nearly excited about a, a Battle Angel as I was five years ago when I first heard James Cameron was trying to get this thing put together. I got to say, James Cameron and Robert Rodriguez keeps me excited. But James Cameron is so going to be so devoted for doing these 75 um, uh, uh, Avatar, Avatar films <laughs> that right. he can put. This is going to be a Steven Spielberg situation where Steven Spielberg's, yeah, his name's on the Transformers movies. I don't think he's so. Not, he's, when was the last time James Cameron lent out his name to something that was horrible? But, uh, no, I totally agree. I'm just saying. But like, now he's so committed to these he's four gonna be, Avatar films. He's, he's gonna, not going to be on set every day. They'll Skype his ass in. He'll be a giant floating. <laughs> he's going to be a giant overload. He's a MODOK Robert, creature. stop what <laughs> yeah. you're doing. This looks dumb. And I think I think Robert Rodriguez granted those films that you just listed off. Nine years worth. Were horrible. I like the first machete. I do I too. Want, I like the first five I, minutes of the first machete. I, I unabashedly love the first machete. The second machete was so hard to get through. It was It was a torture test. He's had a lot of bad misses. I thought his Sin City film, the middle one, A Dame to Kill For, was great. The two parts that surrounded it were horrible. So I feel like he's, you know, he's not catching a lot of breaks. I don't think he's untalented. I think he's very talented. He's been very unfocused. I think this might be just the right thing to get the Rodriguez that we saw back then back now. I hope so. so. I really, I I, so. I'm holding out hope for it. Um, do we I sure everybody... love Desperado. Desperado is great. great. Come on. I love Desperado. It's so I mean, good. Yeah, but then there was Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Yeah, I know. I even know. liked Once Upon a Time. I'm here. To, I'm the one bashing Robert Rodriguez, <laughs> and I'll defend Once Upon a Time in Mexico. I like Once Upon a Time in Mexico. All right, Once Upon a Time, we had this thing called Minor Mutations, and nice we're moving segue. on. Yeah. So number one, we got on this week's uh, Minor Mutations. Jeff Bridges joins King, joins the Kingsman, the Golden Circle. Very excited about that. Number two, we got Spider-Man Civil War concept art is dropping online. We've seen a lot of different uh, iterations of. The 
the battle that we just like to call airport. Uh, number three, we got Jeremy Irons saying Batman v Superman deserved its critical throttling, calling it muddled and overstuffed. Ooh, Alfred. Uh, <laughs> number four, we got Mel Gibson was actually offered the role of Odin in Thor before he turned it down. Thank God we had Hopkins sitting around. Um, for number five, we got Spider-Man animated will actually be Miles Morales Spider-Man. So the animated Spider-Man that uh, Lord Miller are doing is actually going to be the Miles Morales Spider-Man, which I think is fantastic news. And finally, number six, please make this reality. Is Rom <laughs> going to be a transform in Transformers the last night? Can we please make this happen? Let's get into this. What do you guys want to talk about? Obviously, I'm leading this off with make that happen, Michael Bay. Don't be a weirdo. I know you got to blow a bunch of stuff up, make some incoherent, strange, $200 million mess with a bunch of robots, but make one of them awesome. Make one of them ROM and make sure that that is done correctly. So that's all I can say about that. What do you guys think? What pops off to you as far as this news? Dude, when I saw the logo for the new Transformers, I read it as Transformers, the first space night. Yes. And I, I had to do a double take, and when I realized it didn't say space on, I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I love ROM. I love ROM, and if they could bring the dire wraiths into, I mean, it, people talk about a G.I. Joe Transformers team up. No, 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 no. <laughs> I want, a, ROM belongs in the Transformers universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? He's not a Transformer, and I don't want him to transform. I want him to be, I think Cybertron should team up with ROM's home planet. Right. And there should be a cadre <laughs> of space knights. Is it Galador? Yes. Yes, and, and the dire race, I mean, bring in a biological They can't villain. use the dire race. That's why not. That's uh, Marvel. So there's Is that a, created by they Marvel? Can't, they can't use the word the Space Knight either because Marvel well, well, keeps I knew that. that. They can't use it because they did the Space Knights miniseries without ROM. Right. So Which we have some good. issues, but the, 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 all the, the See, the this is the problem. Are all I know something about corporate, corporate entities mm -hmm. uh, getting mad when you don't quite mix and manage right. their project <laughs> correctly. But I do think that why can't you have dire race in... A Transformers movie. Can't they work that out? Maybe. If Spider-Man can be in the Avengers right. or Captain America, anything's happen. Anything yeah. can happen. I agree. Like Surprise Day. Like Wednesday. Like Wednesday, which is <laughs> like today. Like Collider Wait, Heroes that's next tomorrow. week. Next week will be Surprise Day. Amy, what surprised you in this list of mutations? Uh, there was much rejoicing when the Miles Morales news broke. Definitely. That's uh, great. I know a lot of very happy people. I'm only kind of just meeting him because I've mm -hmm. never really done Marvel's Ultimate line. Right. Uh, but he, like, the, the Ultimate Spider-Man comic and then his portion of the Ultimate Spider-Man comic were the two things that people really adore from that entire line. Uh, there's other good stuff, too. But uh, it, it's very exciting because a lot of people wanted him to show up in the live-action movies. I was happy that Marvel is doing a Peter Parker because I wanted to see their version of Peter Parker. Totally. But, like, Lord and Miller writing him, that's exciting. Yeah. I, I'm very excited about this movie. So good. How about you, John? Uh, well, look, not to, to be the wet blanket, it has not been confirmed that Miles Morales is going to be the focus. There was a report that came out uh, that's unverified. So just just keep that in mind. It might very well. It might very well. Don't jump off any buildings. It might very <laughs> well be true. But at this point, it has not been confirmed by anybody at Sony or anything like that. That's the case. There is a report by a source, but not being confirmed. So just keep that, take that with a grain of salt. The one that I found very fascinating was the Mel Gibson as Odin, mm. because. Look, let's take all of the, the controversy surrounding Mel Gibson and put that first. I'm not saying pretend it doesn't exist. say just for now, for this conversation, put it aside for a second. In that dreadful movie, The Expendables 3, one of the things that we were reminded of is that Mel Gibson is one fucking hell of an actor. Mm -hmm. He's so good. He's into this terrible garbage movie. And every moment that he's... That one scene where he's talking to them about, I'm going to use you like a meat jacket. Like that, that whole <laughs> scene, I was like, I'm like trembling in my chair. This dude is a world-class director and a world-class actor. And he still carries... He's, he's also big and buff and bulked out now, but... It, I think it would have been very fascinating to see where they would have gone with Odin and how our perceptions of Odin in these Thor mm -hmm. movies would have changed had it been Mel Gibson. Do not get me wrong. I love Anthony Hopkins as Odin. Like when he shows up and Thor's like, yes, father, we'll kill them together. And he's like, silence. The way he does it, his voice with all, I love you, but I'm pissed off at you and I'm trying not to embarrass me around my peers here. Right. Like I <laughs> loved his Odin, yeah. but I must admit, I'm kind of fascinated by what would it have been like with Mel Gibson. I think we got a little taste of it with Russell Crowe as Jor-El, like a weird casting where you're like, Russell Crowe as Jor-El. Yeah. And then you see it and you're like, he was actually pretty cool as yeah, Jor-El. He, he made Jor-El a badass that you would never like we are 
our our thoughts of Jor El. Not sure I really needed Jor El to be a badass, well, but, he saying, but he did a good I'm job. But he did a good job. I'm saying our thoughts of Jor El up until that point were Marlon Brando in some weird aluminum foil suit, like crinkling around. It's like <laughs> that's all I can do about it. Look, I've read the comics, and we got this weird, like shiny dude, and now we got a a guy who's like a battle born warrior dude who's also a scientist. He might as well be Doc Savage. But what? Anybody else have any thoughts about any of these mutations? Well, you, you know, I will I will say that. The Russell Crowe Jor-El and the Marlon Brando Jor-El both have Hot Toys figures. That's right. And I and, believe and, and, and Robert I got, has both of them. I do. They're in the same case. That's and cool. by the way, Hot Toys ROM. Yeah, come on. Come on. Is that happening? Hot Toys. Hot Toys. No, it's not. Oh. But if no. they make it if better they made happen. a ROM in the Transformers movie. Somebody they... just better make a better toy of the ROM thing. that Because I have the original ROM. I bought it like on eBay. I was like, oh, I want to get that original ROM. It's like a duck. It's it has weird it's legs. Duck. It's like some strange aberration. Of like, the, I don't know how to make an action figure. I'll make the weirdest <laughs> shaped, strange thing that barely. I have it. I had it like in my office for a while, and then I got tired of looking at it because it's so horrible. It's such remember a they bad. Remember they made the, they made a Battlestar Galactica Colonial Warrior figure out of the same ROM yes, yes. thing. It was just it's not. Just, you know, good. Mattel, get on that and make a new ROM. Come on, there's a bunch of weird adults who want to buy it. All right, let's get into flashbacks. Not this Mattel, week. Hot Toys. Well, I'm just saying Mattel owns the rights. Sell them to Hot Toys and Please. get a goddamn ROM figure going. Flashback. It's Blade Trinity. It's from 2004, the third film in the Blade trilogy. This one was written and directed by David Goyer, who wrote the very first two Blade films before he went on to like be writing all the DC superhero films. Wesley Snipes is back once again as the Daywalker Blade, but this time Whistler, played by the craggly Chris Christopherson, has brought him some teammates called the Night Stalkers. Hannibal King, played by the wise Kraken Ryan Reynolds and Whistler's daughter Abigail played by Jessica Beale and a bunch of other people. We got to see Patton Oswald as some kind of funny weapons expert who care who really cares. It's I mean it's Patton Oswald. He was awesome. This this time they got to fight the granddaddy of all vampires, Dominic Purcell, an armored pre-prison break Dracula, Dracula, I'll just, his name is Drake, the first of all vampires, who has a slew of other helpers, one of them played by Parker Posey, she's always awesome, and the giant Triple H. So Blade has to fight the armored pre-Captain Heat, who then turns into a wicked prosthetic demon vampire at the end. This All this is, you know... Uh, before all this, you know, vampire stuff, there's a lot of fighting. Uh, the off-camera antics that you might have read about online between Goyer and Wesley Snipes has way more entertainment value than this movie, uh, this third entry. Let's talk about Blade Tr Trinity and what our thoughts are as far as this third Blade film. I'll start with you, Amy. Oh, no, don't start with me. Um, oh, yes, let's start with you. I didn't know this was our flashback for this week, and this is another one that oh, really? I haven't actually seen. But you, did you see the Blade or Blade 2? I have not seen a Blade movie. Okay, well, I'm no. gonna get roasted. No, you're not. Just see Blade one and two. Robert, yes. let's start with you with Blade three, Blade Trinity. Well, there's a really great Jessica Biel Hot Toys action figure from Blade <laughs> Trinity. Okay, uh, that's about the best thing I can uh -huh. say about this film. I mean, it's clear that the tension between the director and the star permeates every frame of this movie. This mm -hmm. is the movie where Wesley Snipes is a guest star in his own movie. Right. Pretty much. He stayed in his trailer stone the whole time. And, and I, you know. Whether you like Blade Two or not, it still has Guillermo del Toro's crazy, beautifully imaginative vampires like Nomak, you know, whose face opens. Screw up anybody like who does like Blade Two. Yeah. Blade Two is awesome. And it yeah. takes place in some weird. It's dark all the time in Prague or wherever they shot it, and it's not like Blade One that begins with this awesome dance scene with an awesome New Order the remix. Blood yeah. and the Blood, Blood Rave. Rave. It's one of the great. Not a great ending, but but the first Blade is a great techno. If you like EDM yeah. music, it's a great. I, 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 those movies, that reputation. This, this film, just... this film, is flatly directed. It just, it just, it looks like it takes place, you know, in three blocks of downtown Los Angeles. It's shot like a bad TV movie in Vancouver. It's not great. Yeah, John. Um, I remember walking out of that movie. And like me and my buddy went to go see it. I could not talk my girlfriend at the time into seeing it with us. So she just drove us and dropped us off. She couldn't bring herself to come in. And then she picked us up outside and she's like, so do, should I regret not going? No. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> she's got a, she's, she's got a lightsaber bow. What? Yes. You heard me right. She has a lightsaber bow. <laughs> um, if anything, you could tell the entire purpose of this movie was to set up a night stalkers uh, right. film right. of their own. That was the whole purpose of the movie. So instead of getting, which is a shame because I actually thought Hannibal King and uh, Jessica Biel's ch ch character, Abigail, Abigail yep. Whistler. I actually thought just as characters and as this Night Stalker team, there could have been something pretty interesting yeah. there. And what highlights there were in the movie 
were those two. Yeah. And so ironically, trying to force a Night Stalker series is what ruined this movie. But ironically, those two were probably the best part of the movie. But here's the thing that really pissed me off <laughs> about this film, okay? Is that in most great vampire movies, and like in the first Blade, right. if a vampire comes to your town, you got to come up with a lot of luck, a huge plan, a lot of people, and you got to come up with a way to fight this one vampire. As the Blade movies have progressed, vampires have become a joke to the point now that you got Beale and and uh, Ryan there walking in, and they're just human beings, exceptional human beings, but just human beings. And they're all taking out 40, 50 vampires at a time. Like, vampires are a joke now. Right. Send in a kid in a garden with a, with a cold, and they'll kill 15 <laughs> vampires. And it was just such an awful way to end what could have been a really solid trilogy, because one and two were great. I especially love two. Yeah. And then three is like, Wow. What is so this bad. travesty we yes. have upon but us? But Ryan Reynolds is still really good in this movie. Ryan Reynolds is, is one of the greatest. I liked him in this movie. Like his interaction with Parker Posey and Triple H, all the, the 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 scenes with Hannibal King, like you said, and Abigail were really fun. I like the development of the Night Stalkers. I think Wesley did a very big disservice to himself by like playing all those games that we've read about online. You could read it all the read it. Just type in Blade Trinity. There's a million stories that'll pop up. There's no defending his behavior on Saturday. No, I mean, a lot of a lot of just bad stuff went down. So I don't think anyone was having fun on set and it transfers into the film where it's slightly disjunctive and strange. Nothing will ever take the first Blade away from me where I literally went with a friend of mine, Dave Foss, who wasn't a big comics fan. I was like, let's just go see this Blade movie. It'll probably suck, whatever blood rave we're like what is this movie <laughs> vampires being like exploding with flames it was like it was so cool to finally see like not just a superhero like blade as a lot of you know is a character from marvel comics but no one on the planet earth knew that when the movie came out they were just like what's up with this vampire so it was a vampire movie not a comic book right. movie to most people at the and time. it really really worked and i think they did a great job and wesley snipes did a great job as blade and blade 2 i thought amped it up even b bigger and better. Blade 2 was just a perfect sequel. And Blade 3 just kind of, you know, fell apart and didn't work out. I even thought Dominic Purcell as the, you know, Lord of the Vampires was kind of oh, lame. Oh, no, that was lame. That it was, was just so a lot of bad. it was just not worked out really well. So, you know, whatever. I know uh, Goyer went on to write like a million superhero films. He like co-wrote, you know, The Dark Knight, The Batman Begins with the Go with uh, the Nolan. Oh, yeah. So, you know, he, Love Goyer. he yeah, he's able to do a lot of uh, good superhero films. It's not like this was the worst super film ever made. So um, what, what's your uh, uh, if I miss the boat on these right. I have to watch one have to watch two what do you say keep going or stop stop, stop. oh stop <laughs> after, <laughs> after two yeah. not even for like fun value no, no. just no. stay away no. and just well, watch even it. Blade 1 has a goofy climax right because it was it was kind of half baked they, they didn't, didn't quite figure know it out. How, yeah. yeah they didn't the figure blood it out. god right yeah, it, it was, doesn't really work and if you go online you could see what they originally had shot as the blood god it's horrible so thank god at least they, they were like we don't have any more money it's gonna look horrible but at least it's not this so they <laughs> You know, that's what happened with Blade 1. Just <laughs> fell apart in the last 10 minutes. They're like, we don't even know what we're doing. Can we just run credits? No, we have to have the blood god in there. Have you guys <sighs> ever seen yeah. a, a, a British television show ran six episodes called Ultraviolet? No. It came out around the first Blade. I love the vampire world in the first Blade, this arist aristocratic, we all go to cool raves, but yes. yeah, we're all rich and wear cool Tom Ford outfits. Mm -hmm. I love that. Watch if you find it. Go find Ultraviolet and watch Ultraviolet. This is different than the Mia, Mia Jovovich ultraviolet. ultraviolet. Yes, it's not like that at all. This is a British. She was a vampire too in that. So this is a British TV show that stars the dude that was at the beginning of Kingsman who dies. Ah. The King no, of I've, I've heard of Ultraviolet, so I will definitely look it up. Um, our spotlight this week is The Invisibles by Grant Morrison. Uh, Grant Morrison is the king of the trippy comic, and lots of this headway was made with the comic book series The Invisibles, which supposedly was told to Morrison by aliens. Um, this bizarro conspiracy, dripping, super chaotic, ragtag mystery science fiction freak fest tells the tale of King Mob and his magical group of psychic sorcerers called The Invisibles. You got Moonchild, Mr. Six, Ragged Robin, Lord Fanny, Tom O'Bedlam, how about those names? As they induct an angry youth who becomes humanity's savior, Jack Frost. And they do battle with other meta-magical beings with the names like Sir Miles, Archon, and Rex Mundy of the Outer Church, and eventually the Hand of Glory time-traveling device, which helps them in their battles. Can this comic book be adapted into a movie or a television series or just a drug that you can ingest and enjoy all of it. Um, I, for one, think that The Invisibles is ripe for a television series. I mean, I don't know how you could possibly get 
and condense this into a movie? I think it's possible. I think you could just, by just focusing in on the storyline of Jack Frost and maybe the first battle with the Outer Church and maybe then you'd have to get rid of all this other really cool stuff. You could maybe do it as a movie, but I honestly think it would work great on one of these streaming services. Everybody who's doing, you know, these streaming services have millions and billions of dollars. They can't wait to just spend this money. Why not spend it on the Invisibles? Give Morrison and some of Vertigo people some of that money and get this thing going and make the weirdest Netflix or you know Hulu series ever made involving these characters. I think it would be fun. What are your thoughts, Amy? I'm actually reading it right now. Nice. Uh, it's been on my, like I know folks who, like I, I know a guy who made an entire desk out of Invisibles panels. It's mm. like a foundational document for a whole generation of, of comic book readers. Yep. Uh, and it's it's gonna be a tough challenge because it's it takes full advantage of the flexibility of the comic book storytelling where you can throw anything in there and with the right structure and the right context, you can make it work. Right. Uh, especially if you're Grant Morrison, you can change other people's ideas about what can work. So it would be a very high bar of like, innovation to meet we talked about this a bit with uh talking about adapting doom patrol mm -hmm. but it would be awesome and if preacher can be on amc then why not and I, i'm glad you brought that up because i think with the adaptation of what is now dr strange and the worlds and the trippiness that they are having to deal with because that's what dr strange is about is astral projection and strange dimensions with creatures in it and it's all trippy and weird that they're doing that we're going to see how the marvel style adaptation is I'd love to see that even trippier, weirder version of this series. What do you think, John? You know, there have been a couple of things in Spotlight. There have been a couple instances where you brought up something that I had not read before. And then I'd hear you describe it and go, and then I'd run out and get it. No interest. This this <laughs> just, this sounds dumb. I have, I have no interest. Well, it's dumb to you. TV, yeah, to me, to yeah. me, sounds dumb. So, uh, you yeah, know, neither as a TV show nor as a movie would I be interested. I think I, I, I would implore you to read this book. I think you're... The other thing they're going for is that Grant wrote. It. Yeah, like, I, like, I, like... I love this comic. I mean, I, I do think it's very generational. I mean, I think it's very modern now. I think in a way, you know, as the modern age progresses and we get TV entertainments like Mr. Robot, you know, things like that, this this is very much, I think it's a cultural zeitgeist kind of a, a, of a thing. It could really be a flashpoint for, mm -hmm. for people's opinions. It could be a real taste-making show if done correctly. Uh, I really enjoy that stuff. And I think... Netflix is a great place for it. I mean, watching Peaky Blinders and seeing the evocation of the period, how they can bring 1919 and now up to like 1922, Birmingham, England, mm -hmm. and, and and make it convincing. The stuff that goes on in this comic, we have the technology, so why not do it? I, and the, the characters, first of all, King Mob is one of my favorite names of a character ever. Mm -hmm. Like, why not? Why not? It's a cool name. It's, it's all these characters. But again, it's very much Grant Morrison's, it's all of his concerns sort of, this and the filth. I don't remember the yeah. filth. An but unofficial <laughs> sequel to The Invisible. Uh, yes. The thing that could make something like this work is that I feel like our current, especially television moment, uh, it's prepared us to be into a large variety of different kinds of stories. And I haven't had a chance to watch Mr. Robot yet, but like they're bending the rules of sort of standard storytelling on TV is something we're sort of maybe more ripe for. Like I think that's why we're getting a Twin Peaks revival, right. is that we're maybe ready for elements of surrealism. Uh, that depart from the from like the way we do most television. Uh, so it's it's weird. Like it may have taken until now for this to be a feasible option, even though it's a 1994 document. Uh, yeah, and let me let me resell it to you a little bit, John. It's <laughs> it's not just incoherent <laughs> panels of insanity. There's an actual storyline. Sure that's what you called it, though. No. Incoherent panels There's of insanity. There's a great omnibus too. You yeah, get a big nice hardcover. You could basically buy I've all seen of that. them. I, yeah. You could buy all of them at once, or you could just buy a few trade paperbacks. I would recommend sampling the first three trade paperbacks you can get them really cheaply now just check it out it's definitely weird but it's a lot of fun and it's very you could follow it it's not like you just dive into weirdness it's a weird series but it, that's it was very popular for a reason it, it lasted quite a long time plus we're seeing things like you know the wachowski's sense eight that he that, right. that's it's not like that but if you take things like Mr. Robot and Sense8 and Peaky Blinders sort of mix them all together with drugs. Yeah. You know, <laughs> then you're going to get The Invisibles. Yeah. I'd check out The Invisibles. Let us know what you think. You write us in. Um, we're going to go to Twitter questions. This week, Srikar asks, can they incorporate Rom Space Knight into the Transformers movies? Well, yes. I think we talked about that 
Rom better be in those Transformers movies. It's probably the only thing that I would go see Transformers 5 for. Though, I hold out hope. We talk about that all the time. We get sucked in. to going to see these dumb they Transformers movies. They make such good movies. trailers, damn the trailers it. are they, awesome. They trick us. Yeah. <laughs> they got dinosaurs. It's the age of extinction. It's going to be awesome. It's a horrible film. <laughs> horrible, horrible, But Transformers horrible. 1 and 3 are pretty good movies. I, I love the first one. It's a boy in his car. I, 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 like like I, like I did like the third one. I just like the first. I do like the third one where they destroy Chicago because it's always fun to see some Michigan Avenue destruction. I lived in Chicago for 12 years. <laughs> love that. Love seeing. I can't even remember what robot was climbing up Wacker Drive, like whatever the giant Sun Times building. But it was Spock, and he was he was using lines from Star Trek II: Wrath of Khan <laughs> in Transformers. Insanity. Yeah. Anyway, Rom's going to be in there. It's going to be uh, someone's going to you know get some threatening emails. I don't know. <laughs> whatever. Just do it. Do something right, Mattel. Um, Michael Sanders says. Is there a possibility that we'll see X-Men characters like Mr. Sinister, X-23, or Omega Red in the future? So he's talking about in the future films. I think we got a little sneak peek with X-Men Apocalypse at the very end. If you stuck around. Spoiler, Spoiler alert. alert. Oh, God. Hang on. Spoilers. <laughs> All right. Tell this us, made Amy. me so excited. It made me angry because I was still in the middle of, of feeling a little bit let down by the movie. And I was like, why am I such a sucker that you can put the name Essex on a box? And I'm freaking out. Because Mr. Sinister is awesome. He's, he's so good. He's awesome. one of my favorite so X-Men villains. Him and uh, he's the equivalent of Brother Blood for me mm. from the DC Universe. And Those now I've got a baby Jean for him to be obsessed with, which right? is great. Uh, I think also keep that spoiler thing up. Um, I'm pretty sure that Richard E. Grant is playing Mr. Sinister in Wolverine 3. Ooh. By the way, how great is Richard E. Grant Essex. in Game of Thrones? I love him in Game of Thrones hey, just right a little now. Bit, I mean, people would know. I was like, is that Richard E. Grant? We can't stop talking about Game of Richard Thrones e. Grant. on the show of Collider Heroes, but I'm not going to get mad. No, Richard Game E. Grant's Thrones, one of the greatest. He's I, amazing. He, he's one of the great actors of all time. If yes. you haven't seen this movie, most Americans hate this movie, with Nail and I. No, no. Oh, I've, that I've, so good. I've talked about with Nail multiple times <laughs> on Movie Talk. You have to see that movie. With it's Nail one and of I. The, the greatest movies ever made and it, it gets better every time i see, every it. Time see uh, it holly introduced me to again. it i've seen it every year now for six years at least twice a year now it is just amazing with nail and i get on it you know i did hear uh, somebody high ranking up in the production of x-men apocalypse did mention something about clones and future oh yeah you mean like x-23 no that makes total uh, I, I sense mean, Maybe Not that you're sets. saying anything about it, no. Robert. And this isn't, this is, you leave the spoiler thing off, but I personally think X23. In the, in the new upcoming Wolverine movie. Yeah. I think X23 is going to be there. So what if make, not in the Wolverine, since it's far future, she, she might just get introduced in whatever the current, the present is going to be. Um, right. But right. Remember, she has that non-aging gene, too, so yeah. she could be in both. I think it's a smart move. Um, Aaron asks, is there a problem in the DCEU in the tone, if the tone of Suicide Squad is very different from Batman v Superman? Consistency change? Is that necessary? What do you think, John? Uh, I don't... Th Look, every film franchise, especially cinematic universes, have their issues and, and their whatever. But I really don't think that whatever the tone of, of Suicide Squad is points to any kind of a problem. I think it's going to. I think Suicide Squad is going to come out and it's going to be great or it's going to be awful based on its own merits. And I don't think it points to anything extra outside of that. And personally, I think Suicide Squad is going to kick all kinds of ass, and I'm really excited about it. But if it doesn't, I think it's because it'll be because the movie failed, not because of some overarching weakness right how about you robert no, i i agree with you i mean i think a movie a movie should be judged on its own merits this idea even the marvel universe films we started out judging them as individual movies it right. wasn't like they're part of a bigger whole right i mean suicide squad is is going to be what it, it is and it looks like it's very much a, a vision a singular vision and i think that's what we want from our movies is that we we want something that we're going to respond to let's see that singular vision executed and hopefully executed well how about you amy I think there that yeah there's there's room for different tones in one universe. There are probably limits on that, but I don't think we're close to them yet. Uh, the the only thing I think you really have to worry about if you're doing a shared universe is like whatever the facts of this movie are, you have to be able to live with them in your other yes. movies. Yes. You got to get your story stuff straight. Well said. Like if if some crazy tragedy happens and then like half the world gets blown up, it matters in the other movie. There are things like that. But in terms of tone, you can have a Guardians and an Avengers in the same movie in the same universe like yeah, I per I personally hope the tone is different because it's like you know every every movie Ant Man had a totally different tone than Civil War, which had a totally different tone than Thor. So I think they all are in the same universe together, but it's great to have different tastes. So I'm looking forward to a different taste with Suicide Squad. Our next question is from Rome: Do you think Zac Efron 
will be cast as Shazam. So, Zach Efron, right now in theaters and Neighbors 2. Mm -hmm. Let's start out with you, John. You, what do you think about Zach Look, Efron as Shazam? This is not as far-fetched as you might think. One of the things that The Rock is proving is that when he finds people he likes working with, he'll bring them along. Mm -hmm. That's why we got uh, Daddario appearing with him now in Baywatch, because he loved working, working with her in Rumblefish, whatever the name of the earthquake San Andreas. movie was. San Andreas. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Rumblefish. Rumblefish was awesome. <laughs> whatever the earthquake movie was. Yeah. Um, we see that <laughs> happening. And honestly, if you follow Dwayne's uh, social media stuff, he loves Zac Efron. Like they work, they apparently they just get along. Whatever they're working out together, they're doing these. I don't know if you follow them on social media, but they were showing. They were both showing off. How they were entering into these strength competitions and like doing these like the power wheel rolls and all that kind of. Obviously, The Rock was winning all of them, but he was like, <laughs> he was like, this kid is pushing me. Right. And then when you see him, like I th I like Neighbors too. It's not as good as the first Neighbors. But Zach, I've been a Zach Efron defender for a long time. I think he's actually a very good performer. And I thought he's really found his stride with comedy. I thought he was great in Neighbors 2. And I would actually think, if you look at him, like you're supposed to be clean cut, the whatever kind of hero, I still kind of think The Rock's going to play Black Adam and Shazam. I mm -hmm. really kind of do. But if not, because The Rock likes working with them, I, I think this is not as far-fetched as you might think. I agree. How about you, Amy? You're making a very persuasive case. I <laughs> laughed when I saw the question. But I guess that that's one of those, like, just because somebody got famous as a kid, they don't stay a kid. They need second acts. And it's, this is the kind of, like, this is in par for the course. I should be surprised. If it works out, that'll be great. And we'll all not remember what it was like to not believe that was likely. <laughs> well, I mean, also, Zach Afron has some, you know, he's shown some different skills as far as not just being in, in Neighbors. He was in The Paperboy, which I thought was a great performance. And that's what made me think, wow, that kid can and act. And me and Orson Welles. Right. And like, if you have not seen that movie, it was a smaller film. It's directed by... Um, Oh, is the, the name of the director? The, guy, the same guy who did Boy, the 13-year uh, shot uh, movie that took 13 years to, sh to Richard shoot. Richard Linklater. Richard Linklater yeah. directed uh, him in uh, Me and Orson Welles. He is fantastic in that. Check it out. Um, you know, I I got to say, I really like Zac Efron. <laughs> and I watched one of these Nicholas Sparks movies that he was in. Right. Oh, I, ne I, I know the one you're I never about. saw the beginning of it, so I don't know the name of the movie. I turned it on the cable, and like, he, he walked across the United States. Like he walks, he was an ex, he was a veteran, he was in a, like in Iraq, and he's, he's got shell shock or PTSD, and he walks across America to Louisiana and falls in love. And I have to tell you, I, I was sucked in. I was sucked in by his performance. I was sucked in that he walked across America, and I am a sucker for a good romance. And I watched the whole thing, did not see the beginning of the film, have no idea what the name of that so movie was. So you would be sucked in <laughs> if he was Shazam? I, 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 think, I think he's a little short. It, but his he's got the Shazam face right. and his physique. Obviously, I heard uh, he's massive. Uh, <laughs> Zach, um, um, you know, star of Neighbors Two, uh, Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen. Zach. <laughs> Seth Rogen talked about how ripped he was and what good shape he was and, in and how much fun he was to work with. And I'm like, you know what? He looks like Shazam. Photoshop a picture of somebody of Zach Efron's face from Neighbors Two mm -hmm. onto a Shazam, onto an Alex Ross Shazam That's body, right. and we'll see how good it is. Well, it's very possible. You know what's? Uh, let's move on to Hayden. Has an interesting question. Could Marvel incorporate elements from Secret Wars into the Infinity Wars, like Spidey getting his symbiote outfit? Um, interesting. I don't know if it, I would say it, it would almost be too soon to bring uh, the symbiote into the Spider-Man universe. Um, I just want to, I don't know what they're going to do with Infinity Wars. I know that they're, you know, two separate movies. They're both going to have separate titles and they're both going to have a lot of characters in it. Um, having the black outfit, what do you think? It does seem soon for the black outfit. Uh, although it'd be funny to follow up on the precedent of like him getting that in some big crossover and then exploring it in his own right. movie. That would be a neat sort of nod to the fans, but only if it makes sense in context of the movie. There's so much cosmic source material for Infinity War. I'm not sure they need to go to Secret Wars. Um, and we've already got kind of a potentially heroes fighting heroes thing and whatever's going on with Thor Ragnarok. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know that there's necessarily anything that I'd be like, yeah, grab that from Secret Wars to, for Infinity War. How about you? Yeah, I, yeah I'm with you. I, I, I don't, we don't, why do we have to have the black outfit now? I mean, Spider-Man existed for decades before we had the black outfit. Right. Although... Fans love them. Although I would it, say yeah. with Guardians of the Galaxy, if you bring that that cosmic flavor into the movie, 
anything can happen because I think the collector might even have the symbiote. Somebody, maybe sure. the duck carries it around in a satchel or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'd know, love I mean, to see that. I, but but yeah. then again, I always thought that the alien symbiote depends. Look, Venom depends on the context he's presented. And I recently pulled out a Venom uh, miniseries I have. It's like a six-issue miniseries from the 90s. It's not good. <laughs> it's just not good. And and I just think the potential, we've seen a great, great, great portrayal of Spider-Man in mm -hmm. Civil War. Why ruin it with an alien symbiote? I want to see the real human Spider-Man. I want to feel him as a human character and get to know him before he gets an alien symbiote to wear. Sure. What is the timeline like? Do we get the Spidey movie before the first Infinity War? Uh, we do. Yes. Yeah, we do. But yeah. here's the thing. Remember, there's a, there's a comic run where uh, Venom is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. That's true. I think there is a possibility. You could see him actually introduced in a Guardians of the Galaxy film before you see him introduced in a Spider-Man comic. That would, I'll buy that. That would be really cool. That would be freaky. <laughs> I, actually, that's a really... Uh, I would love to see like some other weird dude wearing the symbiote outfit. You'd be like, wait a minute. You know, It's like, that'd be very strange. Darth Box has a question for us. Will J.J. Abrams ever direct a superhero movie? And if he does, what character would you like to see him direct? I I don't I, I don't I, I generally don't like these questions because would I like a good director to direct a good comic book movie? It, it, well, yeah, sure. And who cares? I mean, yes, whatever. If J.J. Abrams directs a superhero, movie, that's fantastic. And whatever character he decides to direct will be the right one. So I really don't have an opinion on it. All right, how about you, Robert? Rom Space Knight. J.J. <laughs> Abrams, yeah, Rom yeah, Space right. Knight. You know it'll I'm have in. some lens flares in oh, it. Maybe just his eye is well, a lens Well, the lens flare. flares will be coming off Rom's like, body. Yeah. You know? It'll be awesome. Shiny body. I say he should bring back the lens flares. He was like, I don't do those lens flares anymore. I was like, J.J., bring that back with Rom. What do you think? I'm, I'm with you in terms of, I, as long as it's something that speaks to him that he gets really excited about, then I'd be on board for it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he could probably do a really cool sort of if you were doing like a, a retro Hal Jordan movie about like growing up and wanting to fly, I feel mm. like J.J. Abrams would probably do a really that's great a job with that. That's a good idea. Uh, I don't know if that's, that doesn't really fit in with what they're doing and what we're getting, but yeah, as long as he's excited, that's what I, I would like to watch. see him take on the Inhumans. I think he would be a really good director for it, especially because of the first season of now Lost. Now we don't know when we're going to get Inhumans. So. I know. Well, I'm just like throwing that in. You know, J.J. Abrams rock on that. Get that Black Bolt and Triton and Karnak and all those freaks in there. All right, Andy, Phil, Andy and Film Bros ask, do you think Brian Singer should take a break from the X-Men films? Well, um, Brian himself has said he's going to, he plans on taking a break. Maybe he's going to, you know, he's obviously doing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but he's not going to go away from the X-Men. I think he d he's done a great job shepherding them, of the X-Men films in general, so I think he'll always stay on as a producer in some capacity. I thought when Matthew Vaughn took over and did First Class, that was great. They need to find other directors of that caliber to continue on. You know, They've got a great director in Tim Miller. He's doing Deadpool too, so I'd like to see that kind of caliber of director continue on. What do you think, Amy? Uh, once again, I, I don't know the guy, but my answer is basically going to be like, if he wants to make more, if he's excited to come back after 20,000 Leagues and he has like, no, 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 I'm not done with this until I get to tell blank story, mm -hmm. then I'm on board. If he would rather take some time to do some other stuff and maybe come back to it with a fresh set of eyes and just advise in the meantime, I'm on board for that too. How about you, Robert? Well, I mean, look, again, like you said, it depends on the storyline. I, I, I think that... You know, Brian did Days of Future Past and Apocalypse. To me, Apocalypse is not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of it that's just great. I mean, I love a lot of Apocalypse. To me, it's not it's not Spectre. Spectre, when Sam Mendes' second film coming after Skyfall, which I thought probably more of a script problem, but he says he's not going to come back and do any more Bond films, right. which I'm glad of. I love Sam Mendes as a director. I don't think he brought his A game to Spectre. Um, so I don't care as long as the director's fired up and there's a great story. How about you, John? He, like you said, he's, he is taking a break. He's going off. He's going to make 20,000. He's going to come back. He's doing what Chris, what Christopher Nolan has always done, which he did a Batman film. Then he went away from Batman. Then he came back to another Batman film. Then went away from Batman. Then came back. And that's what I think these guys need to do. If anything, I thought Brian Singer should have done another film in between Days of Future Past and this. I think this is the right move for him. Mm -hmm. And I, So he is taking a break, and then I want to see him come back. Awesome. Mark has the question, have the Netflix series replaced Marvel's early plans of releasing mid-budget films in the 50 to 60 million dollar range. Um, I don't know if that happened no, or didn't so. happen. So, but I do think that whatever Netflix is doing is pretty awesome. It's working. I think they've <laughs> been knocking it out of the park and all their series. 
I never thought I'd be like, I can't wait to see Luke Cage. And I can't wait to see Luke Cage. I'm, you know, an Iron Fist and the Defenders, which is when I was a young kid, I didn't want to read the Defenders. I was like, it's all the B-list characters. I don't know, why would I even be interested in this? And now I'm like, man, the Defenders is going to be awesome. They got me. So what do you think? Well, I, I didn't know much about the, the, the what he's referring to with the earlier shape of the business plan involving smaller movies. Mm -hmm. And I could see that maybe these are some of the characters that you would have assigned to those budgets. So you can kind of see it as right. a like siphoning of material. But I, I don't know that there was any real causal thing. I think it's just that they didn't do that. And this other thing did come up. And this other thing is going really well. So... How about you, Robert? I, I feel the same way. I mean, I think in this day and age, no one was going to really plan on a mid-level. No, the studios are just not making 50 to $65 million movies except Fox and Deadpool, uh, which was a fluke. You know, it was not something that was ordinarily happening. I mean, I would love to see it, you know, if Marvel did. I don't think if you made a Moon Knight feature, you need to spend $150 million on a Moon Knight feature unless you do his origin in Africa with Bushmen and the mercenaries and all that. Right. But but I, I, I don't think one's replaced the other. I think... Marvel has a very distinct business model, and they're sticking to it, and they've they've stuck to it since since Incredible Hulk and Iron Man. How about you, John? Hollywood loves to copy success. Deadpool is a great example of that. There are, uh, believe me, every studio, including Disney, looked at what Fox did with Deadpool and say, oh, okay, so you can make seven hundred million dollars on a forty million dollar budget, and let's look into that. Yeah, no, I don't think that the Netflix thing is having tremendous success on its own, but I don't think it's changing anybody on the movie side's philosophy of what they're going to do with their films. Totally. If anything, we'll see Gambit go down a little bit in price. Yes. Know? See, that's another movie that should be like a forty-five million dollar, and yeah. you could tell a pretty damn good story. Yes, I agree. Uh, next question, Adriel asks, do you think Jeff Johns will pitch arcs he's made in comics for films, i.e. the Dark Side War, Sinestro War, the Green Lantern stuff? What do you think, Robert? You know, probably not. I think like what Marvel's done with things like Winter Soldier, they'll take elements of those stories, perhaps. But those stories are so comic-centric that the first thing you have to do when making a successful comic book film is adaptation. You've got to adapt these concepts. I mean, Winter Soldier's played out over years, literally. Now, it was pretty, I thought it was pretty faithful what they did, but I think those things, they, they've got a lot more they have to tell. They've got to make stories about these characters first, not about these epic storylines. They mm -hmm. can get to those later. What do you think, John? Um, yes, he'll pitch them. Whether it's a good idea will be really up to whatever the adaptation is. So will he pitch them? Yeah, that's part of the reason why they put him in there is to pitch those types of ideas that he has. But whether they're good ideas or bad ideas, it will be, depend on the individual adaptation. Amy? Same. I, I think especially, like, there's more of a chance that the Green Lantern ones will come through because he has done a large proportion of the best Green Lantern work ever done. He's done a smaller proportion of the best Justice League just because there's been... Uh, don't don't come at me, but, like, uh, you know, his is was much more transformative on Green Lantern. There's a much larger roster of tons and tons and tons and tons of Justice League stories. Uh, so I would say, if I had to guess, it's more likely we'll get one a Green Lantern movie with a title that reminds us of a Jeff Johns story than a title that a Justice League movie with a title that reminds us of one of his there. Definitely. But that's just a proportional thing. Makes sense. Um, TJ Dex asks, does Howard the Duck deserve a second chance? <laughs> no. <clears throat> He, uh, he hashtag no. the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> if if Howard the Duck does indeed carry the symbiote in one of his <laughs> side of pegs, like you suggest, Robert, I'd be 100% in it. I would love to see a really weird Howard the Duck like television series. I think it could be really funny. Howard the Duck is just a very strange, I, you know, if you sat through the, that first Howard the Duck film, I'm sorry I did too. But uh, I think there's something there that could be really weird and funny. What do you think, Amy? Uh, well, if you mean should we watch that movie again, no. No. Um, but if you mean could there be potential future life in that character, the answer on some level is always yes, there's potential future life in many characters. Do I see it fitting into what they have going on right now? No. How are you? I totally agree with what Amy just said, and the answer is no. <laughs> Robert? I think absolutely. I mean, just go back to the comic books, and now there's CG technology. They're, part of the reason that movie just doesn't work is it's this weird guy in a suit. That was you one know. of the endearing things Howard, about to I, me, see, actually. I mean, the honest. Dark Overlords, the visual effects at right. the end of that film are great. There's a lot of really interesting Cherry Bomb, you know, in that yeah. uh, Thomas Dolby's music. You got Seth Green playing yeah. Howard the Duck now. He's in the end at Guardians. So. Well, I, yeah, and I think that, that the character of Howard the Duck in those comics, you know, trapped in a world he never made. Mm -hmm. I mean, that those comics are really heady, you know, counterculture stuff from the 70s. And I think, of course, America's about second chance. Should Howard the Duck go Fritz the Cat 
Should we get all R rated? Oh, and I stuff? would love that. All right. Well, I would, by like, the way, everyone, Fritz Cat, nobody, nine lives of Fritz Cat, nobody will go see it. Fritz the Cat, check it out, Ralph Bakshi. But yeah, you're right. No <laughs> one would see it. So let's do, we'll return to Howard the Duck in four years and get back to you. <laughs> Charlie asks thoughts on the early Suicide Squad reactions. I think he's referring to reactions about uh, you know reshoots or something. Well, there was Twitter reactions. It was screened. There was there was a oh, screening really? of the movie. Yeah, and and people there was favorable tweets oh, about good. it. But I do think. As we've all heard, they've brought in, I've heard, a third editorial team right. to do the quote-unquote MTV cut of the movie. Right. Whatever that means, I don't know. I mean, I think, again, I think it's a tonal issue. I think one person went one way on the tone. Right. Now they're trying to figure out, like, uh-oh, what have we done? Right. You've got to pick a direction and go in that direction. Yeah, and usually you do that before you start shooting. Right. Usually you do that in pre-production meetings when everyone's on the same page. And don't start trying to reshape the film after it's been shot. So, you know, we'll see what happens with Suicide Squad. I still have high hopes for it. Um, I know. What do you think? I know. I th I think it's going to be great. I really do. And like, here's the thing, though. Remember this. Just keep this in mind. Yes, there was an early screening, um, and the reactions coming out were good. And I think it's actually the reactions coming out were amazing. But don't forget that premiere of Batman v Superman that they did prior to the critic scene and all that kind of stuff. I, if it's the atmosphere, the premiere, the atmosphere, whatever, all the tweets coming out about that was like, screw Ben Hur, it's Batman v Superman. Like, the, the, that's everything, all the tweets coming out was like, this is the greatest movie ever made. And then the audience just saw it and didn't really. So I believe Suicide Squad is going to be awesome, but not because the reactions coming out of that thing were any good. To me, the, you can just write those reactions off, but I still think it's going to be awesome. Amy? I just got to wait and see this one. I hope it's great. Yeah, but right. We do I too. I hope on. it's great. I want it to be great. Uh, next question. Acob Rani asks, do you think Doctor Strange will connect with Thanos, the Infinity Gems, and death itself? Um, in the Doctor Strange solo introduction film, probably not as much. I think we're going to find out that maybe he has one of those gems, maybe as an after credits thing. We know that he's going to be in whatever that Avengers Infinity War film is. He's been, you know, the writers basically straight up said, we were trying to figure out how to get Doctor Strange in there. So you're saying Doctor Strange is going to be. So we know that almost every Marvel Universe character is going to be showing up in some way, shape, or form, if not in the first Avengers film, in the next one. So, and it kind of makes sense. There's two gems left. You got Thor Ragnarok and you got Doctor Strange. Those gems are going to be showing up in those movies. Otherwise, you don't have the gauntlet, son. It has to happen. So what are your thoughts about Doctor Strange connecting with death itself? Yes, they will have a connection with uh, with Thanos just because we're getting closer and closer. So there, there's going to be a connection some way, somehow. I tend to believe it's exactly what you said. I think you're right on the money. It's going to be a post-credit thing. They're going to introduce it. And uh, it's, it'll be as simple as that. It's not going to play a major part in Doctor Strange, but it's going to be... As long as it's not Thanos, ah, there, I'm going to have to do it myself again. Again. Like, no! No, <laughs> I really have to I do really it myself. I really have to, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put the glove on again, Robert. I, you know, who knows? I, um, our Lord and Savior, Kevin Feige, can do a lot of good things. I think, I think he's already thought about a way to incorporate all of these characters and instances and people and gems into the movies. They already know what they're going to do. Like the Cylons, he has a plan. Yes. Amy? Uh, I... I do think there'll be a connection. I don't know whether it'll be just in the, the post-credits thing or whether it'll be the way, like, the Thor Dark Matter, where it's like, that's probably tied in somehow, but the Thor movies, they, they stand alone. It's just that they'll use that element as one of the building blocks when we get to the big one. That's what I've been assuming, is yeah. there'll be something involved, either MacGuffin-wise or, like, something introduced in this movie that will end up playing a role. Makes a lot of sense. I think we'll find out very soon. Doc Strange comes out this November. Uh, last question before we get to the sweaty question of the week is by Luis E. de la Pena, and he asks, what is your favorite superhero costume, storyline, or iteration from comic books, TV shows, or films? Kind of a very giant, large, general question. <laughs> hey, Snip, what's your favorite? All right. Well, <laughs> hey, just, just general. What's I, your favorite anything? Do Dr. Doom, baby. <laughs> By it's the way, why did Robert and I not get the note about us matching our Doctor Doom outfits? I know. Right? Doom well, I, I know. Well, I I I Amy has got an amazing Doctor <laughs> Doom, the super cool Doom shirt with the shades, and I went old school Kirby style. We didn't know about but, it. We just so doomed what's out. What's your favorite costume or storyline or iteration from comics, TV shows, or movies? Go anything. Like I, I don't get the question. Pick, pick something. Fish. <laughs> I what, love fish. What's your favorite comic book? 
My favorite costume. I was, thinking, I was, thinking, I was thinking costumes. All right, uh, you know what? I'll tell costume. you something. My favorite costumes actually come out of George Perez's run on Teen Titans. Ooh. New Teen Titans. Nice. I love Brother Blood and I love Deathstroke. I love Tara as well. Tara's got a great costume. I love, I mean, Nightwing. I love all the costumes that George Perez drew. I mean, when you saw him doing that first Nightwing costume, I'm like, he's got to draw that every issue now? <laughs> yep. I mean, that's rough. No wonder they gave him just a dark costume and one little thing. But. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Impossibly huge question. So know, right? yeah. my and answer is Chris Claremont. All right. Yeah. Magne Good Magneto in the comics. His costume right. is fantastic. Perfect. Now we get to the sweaty question of the week, and it's by Dan S. And he asks, what's the most super sweaty thing, comic, you'd love to become a TV show movie? Like Strike Force Moratori is high on his list. So once again, we're on a ROM theme. Get that ROM movie going, son. That's what I'll say. What is, what's it like that hasn't been made into well, the thing that makes you get extra sweaty? It's you want to funny see that he mentioned Strike Force Moratory because I have been rereading both Strike Force Moratory because I've been going through my comic books and Alien Legion. Mm -hmm. I want to see an Alien Legion animated series, R rated, on Netflix. You know, there's not that many issues. They, they, there was 20 issues in the first series, 18 issues in the second. Then they did some prestige format miniseries. I loved Alien Legion. Yep. It's great. And reading it again, if you haven't read Alien Legion, there's collected versions of it out. Uh, it's Alan Zeletnitz Zel Zel yeah. Zel and, and, and Carl Potts. Yeah. And, uh, Carl Potts. It's was, great. It's really good. It's, it's a lot of it's fun. It's basically the Avengers in space. The Star Wars Avengers. John, all of it. how about you? The, the best comic book that would be set up for a TV series. I, it's, I'm obsessed with this comic book and I can't even remember the name off the top of my head. But we had the author on. He came. He brought his comic book. Mm -hmm. It's the one about... this. Tell me this would not make a great TV show. The dude, the lead character, is a human, just regular human dude, who's a parole officer for supervillains. It writes itself. And the comic is so good. What's it called? And I'm trying. It was like episode one, two, or three. We had the author on. Are you talking about Chris Burnham, the artist? Yes. Yeah, Officer Down. Is that the name of it? Yeah, Officer Down? Oh, you're talking about his no. other comic book. Yeah, it's the one where it's the lead character is... is, is uh, Because Officer Down is... And it's the one where on comic. the cover, the, the girl is shirtless, and each of her breasts have their own face. And they, and they each <laughs> That's talk. Right. But I'm telling... I will run... I will we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes. But I'm telling you, this comic is freaking amazing. If you talk something that could be a procedural TV show that's built for it, a parole officer... For super villains, and it's so good. So we'll put we'll put the link in the notes there. It's funny I need to that you know say what that. that is. I don't know. It's this. Chris Chris Burnham, and it, he yes. did it. It's, it only got reprinted once. So, mm. so uh, yeah, it's a it's a fun comic for sure. What's I have to say another big question, but my, my answer is the one like it's been almost happening a million times. But I, why why don't I have a Why the Last Man TV show yet? I know, right? I think it's in development, but it's in development hell. So. Eventually that will happen because it was like going to be a movie. And I'm worried that, that the audience will be super burned out on like post-apocalyptic type stories, but whatever, it'll be great. Yeah. I think Nixon's, it'll be pals. Great. What's Nixon's pals. Nixon's pals. Nixon's pals. <laughs> awesome. Yep. It's a very fun. So fun. Crazy. Such a good, such a good little We'll have to have story. Chris Burnham come back on the show and talk a little bit about Nixon's pals. In the coming weeks on Wednesday, which will be next week, check it out. This, that's been it for Heroes, episode 59. I'd like to thank the guests. Robert, where can people find you online? Uh, as always, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett, on Twitter at Burnett RM, or on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. John? You can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. And of course, watch mine and Schnepp's show, Film HQ. I'm, I'm being told it's like the number one show on Comic Con HQ. Go on over to www.comic conhq.com. Sign up for your free trial until after Comic Con. Our show, Film HQ, a lot of other great shows are on there right now, and it's free for a couple of months. Yeah, definitely check out Comic Con HQ and our show Film H Film HQ, which is a lot of fun. We get we get into a bunch of stuff, and it's it's a more of a produced show, so you'll you'll check it out when you see it. It's it's, it's a few of them are online right now. Yeah, there's a few online right now that you can find, but you can get all four of the episodes that are right now on Comic Con HQ. Yeah, and it's all it's free. So Amy, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter as Enthusiamy. I'm often over on Geek and Sundry. I have my own show called Future Girl, and I really hope I'll be able to join you guys sometimes again in the. Yes, we are we're gonna make sure. But Amy if not, Dallin. you've all been super kind. Yeah. She might not be able to be on every episode coming up because we moved to Wednesday, and Wednesday is comic book day, and Amy does work at one of the cool comic book shops, show. House great. of Secrets, but we're going to make sure she's on the show as much as possible. We're not letting this girl go. She's <laughs> awesome. I'm John Schnepp. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Uh, and I'll see you guys next week on Clo I almost forgot. I'll be at Phoenix Comic Con this coming weekend. So anybody who's at Phoenix, 
You can check out uh, my nerdiness. I'm going to be showing the death of Superman lives, what happened, and uh, I'll, I'll be I'll have a booth there. So just check it out. All the people in Phoenix. I'll see you guys next week on Wednesday. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.